Section one of Mark Twain in the New York Times. Part one, eighteen sixty seven to eighteen seventy nine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mark Twain in the New York Times. Part one, section one, May first, eighteen sixty seven. New publications. Read by John Greenman. In a handsomely printed and tastefully bound little volume called The Jumping Frog, which is the initial venture of Mr. C. H. Webb as a publisher, Mark Twain presents himself a candidate for the honors of a humorist. Mark Twain is, we believe, the nom de plume of Mr. Samuel Clements, S.I.C., who, although a Missourian by birth, has for the last year had his residence in California. There his contributions to the weekly journals secured him a wide popularity, and this volume serves to introduce him to the lovers of humor in the Atlantic states. The sketch from which the book takes its name was first published several years ago, and at that time was widely circulated through the newspapers. It is a fair specimen of the whimsical fancies in which the book abounds, and, although there are other sketches nearly equal to it in merit, it is appropriately assigned the leading place because it has done more than any other single paper to secure for the writer whatever reputation he may have mark twain differs from other recent writers of his class in not resorting to the adventitious aid of bad spelling to make his jokes seem more absurd and this is of course decidedly in his favor there is a great deal of quaint humor and much pithy wisdom in his writings, and their own merit, as well as the attractive style in which they are produced, must secure them a popularity which will bring its own profit. The American News Company are the agents for the publisher, and he is, by the way, also editor of the volume. End of Section 1 May 1, 1867 New Publications Read by John Greenman Section 2 of Mark Twain in the New York Times, Part 1, 1867 to 1879. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain in the New York Times, Part 1, Section 2, May 7, 1867. Mark Twain's Lecture. Read by John Greenman. A full and attentive audience assembled at the Cooper Institute last evening to listen to the recital of Mark Twain's experiences in the Sandwich Islands. Nearly everyone present came prepared for considerable provocation for enjoyable laughter, and from the appearance of the mirthful faces leaving the hall at the conclusion of the lecture, but few were disappointed, and it is not too much to say that seldom has so large an audience been so uniformly pleased as the one that listened to Mark Twain's quaint remarks last evening. The large hall of the Union was filled to its utmost capacity by fully two thousand persons, which fact spoke well for the brilliant reputation of the lecturer and his future success. Mr. Twain's style is a quaint one, both in manner and method, and throughout his discourse he managed to keep on the right side of his audience, and frequently convulsed it with hearty laughter. Some of the anecdotes related were wittily told, and so embellished as to be doubly enjoyed by his hearers. While the speaker made some very amusing comments upon the habits and customs of the Sandwich Islanders, he stated that all the facts related by him were strictly true, and several of them appeared quite strange as well as true. The speaker gave the American missionaries great credit for their work in civilizing and converting the islanders, and spoke of the singular fact that the descendants of these missionaries have no stain upon their moral character, being exemplary citizens. During his description of the topography of the Sandwich Islands, the lecturer surprised his hearers by a graphic and eloquent description of the eruption of the great volcano which occurred in 1840, and his language was loudly applauded. Judging from the success achieved by the lecturer last evening, he should repeat the experiment at an early day. 
End of section two, May seventh, eighteen sixty seven, Mark Twain's lecture, read by John Greenman. Section three of Mark Twain in the New York Times, part one, eighteen sixty seven to eighteen seventy nine. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain in the New York Times, part one, section three. June ninth, eighteen sixty seven. THE PLEASURE EXCURSION TO EUROPE AND PALESTINE SAILING OF THE QUAKER CITY READ BY JOHN GREENMAN The steamer Quaker City, Captain Duncan, sailed from this port yesterday, having on board the private excursion party destined for a summer trip up the Mediterranean, touching at Gibraltar, Marseilles, Genoa, Leghorn, Naples, Smyrna, Joppa, Alexandria, Malta, Valencia, madeira etc and returning the latter part of october this excursion was set on foot some four months ago by captain duncan and was originally designed to embrace a select and somewhat exclusive party but before the steamer sailed it was found necessary to lower the standard a little and ordinary persons with one thousand two hundred dollars to spend were enabled to purchase tickets Rev. Henry Ward Beecher, who was early announced to be of the party, found it inconvenient to make the trip, and more recently General Sherman was compelled to forego the pleasure, so that after the withdrawal of these two leading names from the Bill of Attractions, the passenger list gradually diminished until the steamer was obliged to sail with about half the complement of names provided for in the original program. Nevertheless, the party will doubtless be equally jolly, if not quite so select as it first contemplated, and the excursion cannot fail to prove a pleasant and enjoyable mode of passing the summer. It is designed to reach the leading ports in the following order. Marseilles, about 27th June, Naples, 27th July, Constantinople, 13th August, Alexandria, 12th September, Gibraltar, 2nd October, arriving home before November 1st. At all of these places the steamer will stop long enough to give the excursionists an opportunity to make a trip into the interior and visit adjacent points of interest. Those who prefer to remain on board the steamer while lying in port will be allowed to do so without additional expense. The sailing of the steamer yesterday morning drew together a large throng of people upon the wharf, composed mainly of the friends and relatives of the passengers many of whom accompanied the Quaker City down the bay in the steamboat S. O. Pierce, which was chartered for the occasion. The excursionists number about seventy-five persons, as follows. A. F. Allen, New York City. Dr. E. Andres, Albany, New York. J. G. Tarry, St. Louis, Missouri. Mr. and Mrs. A. Dell, Portsmouth, Ohio. T. S. Beckwith, Cleveland, Ohio. M. S. C. Y and Miss F. Beach, Brooklyn, Dr. G. Birch, Missouri, Mr. and Mrs. J. W. and Miss Bond, St. Paul, Missouri, Dr. M. Brown, Circleville, Ohio, Johannes Brennan, Philadelphia, Rev. H. Bullard, Wayland, Massachusetts, S. Mark Twain, Clemens, California, Miss Shadane, Jersey City, W. F. Church, Cincinnati, Ohio, Dr. A. and Master Crane, New York City, Mr. and Mrs. W. D. Crocker, Cleveland, Ohio, D. H. Cutter, Long Island, Nathan Deccan, Long Island, J. W. Denny, Winchester, Virginia, Mr. and Mrs. Fred Diamond, Norwalk, Connecticut, Mrs. C. C. and Sons, G. H. Duncan, Brooklyn, P. A. Elliott, Columbus, Ohio, Mrs. Fairbanks, Ohio, J. Herman Foster, Pennsylvania, W. and Mrs. Giason, Jamestown, Pennsylvania, Rev. F. H. Greer, Boston, Massachusetts, John Greenwood, Jr., New York City, S. M. Griswold and Wife, New York City, General B. B. Grubb, Burlington, New Jersey, Mrs. J. O. Green, Washington, G. Heiss, Philadelphia, Captain W. R. Hoyle, Cincinnati, Hon. J. S. Holdenian, Harrisburg, Rev. E. C. Hutchinson, St. Louis, James K. Hyde, Sudbury, J. G. Isham, Cincinnati, Ohio, Dr. A. A. Reeve Jackson, 
Stroudsburg. W. E. James, Brooklyn. Frederick P. Jenkins, Boston, Massachusetts. Colonel P. Kinney, Portsmouth, Ohio. Charles L. Langdon, New York City. Miss Lacau, San Francisco, California. Daniel Leary, New York City. Mrs. F. G. Lee, New York City. Mr. and Mrs. E. R. Lockwood, Newark, Connecticut. J. M. May, Janesville, Wisconsin. Mrs. Mitchell, Boston, Massachusetts. Miss Maggie Mitchell, Boston, Massachusetts. L. Moody, Canton, New York. J. Moulton, St. John's, Missouri. A. Nelson, Alton, Illinois. F. S. Nesbitt, Fulton, Missouri. Miss Newell, Janesville. W. A. Otis, Cleveland. C. C. Payne, Pennsylvania. Rev. A. L. Park and Miss Park, Boston. G. H. Persons, New York. Dr. and Mrs. J. H. Payne, Boston. G. W. Kerol, Aurora. S. N. Sandard, Cleveland. S. L. Severance, Cleveland. Daniel Sloat, St. Louis. S. Willits, Long Island. End of Section 3, June 9, 1867. The Pleasure Excursion to Europe and Palestine, Sailing of the Quaker City. Read by John Greenman. Section 4 of Mark Twain in the New York Times, Part 1, 1867 to 1879. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain in the New York Times, July 23, 1871. A Real Church, and A New Beecher Church, read by John Greenman. A Real Church. We print elsewhere an account of a church proposed, if we may believe the gentleman who calls himself Mark Twain, to be erected in Elmira, according to the plans and wishes of Rev. Thomas K. Beecher. The writer of this account has on several occasions deluded a too credulous public with what appears to him practical jokes, and this tale of his may be only another joke. But if it is, it is admirably conceived and worthy to be made a fact. He relates that Mr. Beecher, who is a well-known and justly esteemed clergyman in Elmira, proposes, and his congregation consents, to erect a series of buildings in connection with the church proper, to include Sunday school rooms, a lecture room, an assembly room, where any member of the church may give a social party to his friends, an infirmary for the care of the sick poor belonging to the church, thoroughly fitted and supplied with attendance and with a kitchen, a set of bathrooms where the church members, or those who have no such conveniences at home, may bathe free of charge, and a free library. In connection with the infirmary, the church is to keep a horse and carriage to give its sick poor the air. To a good many people such a scheme as this would doubtless seem quixotic and impracticable. To us, we confess, it appears not only practical, but eminently wise. What is the object of a church? For what do a number of people unite together as a church organization? Is it to erect, furnish, and maintain a showy building, and install therein and support a brilliant orator, to whom they shall listen once, or perhaps twice, in the week, and who shall reflect upon them much glory? That appears undoubtedly the main object of most congregations. To be sure, they do something more. They support, if they are rich, missionary chapels for the accommodation of the poor, they are benevolent in various ways, but many of the ways, though convenient, are essentially wrong and sometimes, in the long run, mischievous, because they separate the rich from the poor. A church, to be complete and properly organized, ought to include poor and rich alike. It ought to provide for the wants of both. It ought to bring them together, to establish and maintain between them mutual relations of kindness and brotherly interest. It ought to provide for its sick poor. It should see after the welfare of its members. In short, it ought to do what, according to Mark Twain, 
Mr. Beecher's church proposes to try in Elmira. Fewer psalms and more supper was what a little street urchin proposed in London as an amendment to the practice of some benevolent body which had taken him in charge, and he was right. Mr. Brace's efforts among the poor children in this city have been successful, because he and those who have labored with him have been able to convince the children that they were interested not only in their eternal, but in their present and material welfare. A few years ago a well-known citizen of Brooklyn, now dead, but still remembered with gratitude by hundreds of young men in this city and elsewhere, was the superintendent of a very popular and successful Sunday school. And it was his constant practice, not only to instruct and train the boys and girls, mostly poor and many friendless, on Sunday, but also to see that they were properly and usefully employed, to look after their advancement in the workshops where they earned their living, to seek employment for those who needed it. In short, he was not only their teacher, he was their helper, their guide, their friend, and ally. He was to them what, if we may believe Mark Twain, Mr. Beecher's people in Elmira proposed to be to all who are of their membership, a helper in the time of need, an encourager, a comforter. His friendship aided and strengthened many hundreds of youth to live upright lives, to resist the temptations of city life, and to be patient, hopeful, and industrious. Thus, to encourage and help by contact, by familiar acquaintance, by example, and by Christian kindness, rather than by the gift of money or old clothes, seems to us to be the true office of a Christian church and we trust Mr. T. K. Beecher, who has the reputation of being a persistent man, will be able to give his plan a fair trial. A NEW BEECHER CHURCH by Mark Twain If Rev. Mr. Smith, or Rev. Mr. Jones, or Rev. Mr. Brown, were about to build a new church edifice, it would be projected on the same old pattern, and be like pretty much all the other churches in the country, and so I would naturally mention it as a new Presbyterian church, or a new Methodist, or a new Baptist church, and never think of calling it by the pastor's name. But when a Beecher projects a church, that edifice is necessarily going to be something entirely fresh and original. It is not going to be like any other church in the world. It is going to be as variegated, eccentric, and marked with as peculiar and striking an individuality as a Beecher himself. It is going to have a deal more Beecher in it than any one narrow creed can fit in it without rattling, or any one arbitrary order or architecture can symmetrically enclose and cover. Consequently, to call it a congregational church would not give half an idea of the thing. There is only one word broad enough and deep enough to take in the whole affair and express it clearly, luminously, and concisely, and that is Beecher. The projected edifice I am about to speak of is, therefore, properly named in my caption as a new Beecher church. The projector is Rev. Thomas K. Beecher, brother of the other one, of course. I never knew but one Beecher that wasn't and he was a nephew. The new church is to be built in Elmira, New York, where Mr. Beecher has been preaching to one and the same congregation for the last sixteen years, and is thoroughly esteemed and beloved by his people. I have had opportunity to hear all about the new church, for I have lately been visiting in Elmira. Now, when one has that disease which gives its possessor the title of humorist, he must make oath to his statements, else the public will not believe him. Therefore I make solemn oath that what I am going to tell about the new church is the strict truth. The main building, for there are to be three, massed together in a large grassy square, ornamented with quite a forest of shade trees, will be the church proper. It will be lofty in order to secure good air and ventilation. 
the auditorium will be circular an amphitheater after the ordinary pattern of an opera house without galleries it is to seat a thousand persons on one side or one end if you choose will be an ample raised platform for the minister the rear half of which will be occupied by the organ and the choir before the minister will be the circling amphitheater of pews the first thirty or forty on the level floor and the next rising in graduated tiers to the walls the seats on the level floor will be occupied by the aged and infirm who can enter the church through a hall under the speaker's platform without climbing any stairs the people occupying the raised tiers will enter by a dozen doors opening into the church from a lobby like an opera-house lobby and descend the various aisles to their places in case of fire or earthquakes these numerous exits will be convenient and useful no space is to be wasted under the raised tiers of pews are to be stalls for horses and carriages so that these may be sheltered from sun and rain there will be twenty-four of these stalls each stall to be entered by an arch of ornamental masonry no doors to open or shut consequently the outside base of the church will have a formidable porthole look like a man of war the stalls are to be so mailed with deadeners and so thoroughly plastered that neither sound nor smell can ascend to the church and offend the worshippers the horses will be in attendance at church but an hour or two at a time of course and can defile the stalls but little an immediate cleansing after they leave is to set that all right again there is to be no steeple on the church merely because no practical use can be made of it there is to be no bell because any ignoramus knows what time church service begins without that exasperating nuisance in explanation of this remark i will state that at home i suffer in the vicinity and under the distracting clangor of thirteen church bells all of whom is that right clamor at once and no two in accord a large part of my most valuable time is taken up in devising cruel and unusual sufferings and in fancy inflicting them on those bell-ringers and having a good time the second building is to be less lofty than the church is to be built right against the rear of it and communicate with it by a door it is to have two stories on the first floor will be three distinct sunday school rooms all large but one considerably larger than the other two the sunday school connected with mr beecher's church has always been a graded one and each department singularly thorough in its grade of instruction the pupil wins his advancement to the higher grades by hard-won proficiency not by mere added years the largest of the three compartments will be used as the main sunday school room and for the weekday evening lecture the whole upper story of this large building will be well lighted and ventilated and occupied wholly as a playroom for the children of the church and it will stand open and welcome to them through all the weekdays they can fill it with their playthings if they choose and besides it will be furnished with dumbbells swings rocking horses and all such matters as children delight in the idea is to make a child look upon a church as only another home and a sunny one rather than as a dismal exile or a prison the third building will be less lofty than the second it will adjoin the rear of the second and communicate with it by a door or doors it will consist of three stories like the other two buildings it will cover considerable ground on the first floor will be the church parlors where the usual social gatherings of modern congregations are held on the same floor and opening into the parlors will be a reception room and also a circulating library a free library not simply free to the church membership but to everybody just as is the present library of mr beecher's church and few libraries are more extensively and more diligently and gratefully used than this one also on this floor and communicating with the parlors will be tell it not in gath publish it not in ascalon six bathrooms hot and cold water 
free tickets issued to any applicant among the unclean of the congregation. The idea is sound and sensible for this reason. Many members of all congregations have no good bathing facilities and are not able to pay for them at the barber shops without feeling the expense. And yet a luxurious bath is a thing that all civilized beings greatly enjoy and derive healthful benefit from. The church buildings are to be heated by steam, and consequently the waste steam can be very judiciously utilized in the proposed bathrooms. In speaking of this bathroom project, I have revealed a state secret. But I never could keep one of any kind, state or otherwise. Even the congregation were not to know of this matter. The building committee were to leave it unmentioned in their report. But I got a hold of it, and from a member of that committee, too. And I had rather part with one of my hind legs than keep still about it. The bathrooms are unquestionably to be built, and so why not tell it? In the second story of this third building will be the permanent home of the church missionary, a lady who constantly looks after the poor and sick of the church. Also a set of lodging and living rooms for the janitors, or janitoresses, for they will be women. Mr. Beecher, holding that women are tidier and more efficient in such a position than men, and that they ought to dwell upon the premises and give them their undivided care, also on this second floor are to be six rooms to do duty as a church infirmary for the sick and poor of the congregation, this church having always supported and taken care of its own unfortunates, instead of leaving them to the public charity. In the infirmary will be kept one or two water-beds, for invalids whose pains will not allow them to lie on a less yielding substance, and half a dozen reclining invalid chairs on wheels. The water-beds and invalid chairs at present belonging to the church are always in demand and never out of service. Part of the appurtenances of the new church will be a horse and an easy vehicle, to be kept and driven by a janitor, and used wholly for giving the church's indigent invalids air and exercise. It is found that such an establishment is daily needed so much so, indeed, as to almost amount to a church necessity. The third story of this third building is to be occupied as the church kitchen, and it is sensibly placed aloft, so that the ascending noises and boarding-house smells shall go up and aggravate the birds instead of the saints, except such of the latter as are above the clouds, and they can easily keep out of the way of it, no doubt. Dumb waiters will carry the food down to the church parlors instead of up. Why is it that nobody has thought of the simple wisdom of this arrangement before? Is it for a church to step forward to tell us how to get rid of kitchen smells and noises? If it be asked why the new church will need a kitchen, I remind the reader of the infirmary occupants, etc. They must eat, and, beside, Social gatherings of members of this congregation meet at the church parlors as often as three and four evenings a week, and so drink tea and ga ga it commences with a g, I think, but somehow I cannot think of the word. The new church parlors will be large, and it is intended that these social gatherings shall be promoted and encouraged and that they shall take an added phase, viz. when several families want to indulge in a little reunion, and have not room in their small houses at home, they can have it in the church parlors. You will notice in every feature of this new church one predominant idea and purpose always discernible, the banding together of the congregation as a family, and the making of the church a home. You see it in the playroom, the library, the parlors, the baths, the infirmary. It is everywhere. It is the great central ruling idea. To entirely consummate such a thing would be impossible with nearly any other congregation in the Union. But after sixteen years of molding and teaching, Mr. Beecher has made it wholly possible and practicable with this one. It is not stretching metaphor too far to say that he is the father of his people, and his church their mother. 
if the new church project is a curiosity it is still but an inferior curiosity compared to the plan of raising the money for it one could have told with his eyes shut and one hand tied behind him that it originated with a beecher i was going to say with a lunatic but the success of the plan robs me of the opportunity when it was decided to build a new church edifice at a cost of not less than forty thousand dollars no more than fifty thousand dollars for the membership is not three hundred and fifty strong and there are not six men in it who can strictly be called rich mr beecher gave to each member a printed circular enclosed in an envelope prepaid and addressed to himself to be returned through the post office confidential it is proposed to build a meeting-house and other rooms for the use of the church to do this work honestly and well it is proposed to spend one year in raising a part of the money in advance and in getting plans and making contracts one year plans and contracts april first eighteen seventy one to eighteen seventy two one year build and cover in april first eighteen seventy two to eighteen seventy three one year plaster finish and furnish april first eighteen seventy three to eighteen seventy four one year pay for in full and dedicate april first eighteen seventy four to eighteen seventy five it is proposed to expend not less than twenty thousand dollars nor more than fifty thousand dollars according to the ability shown by the returns of these cards of confidential subscription any member of the church and congregation or any friend of the church is allowed and invited to subscribe but no one is urged t k beecher pastor to help build our meeting-house i think i shall be able to give not less than blank and not more than blank each year for four years beginning april first eighteen seventy one or i can make in one payment blank trusting in the lord to help me i hereby subscribe the same as noted above name residence the subscriptions were to be wholly voluntary and strictly confidential no one was to know the amount of a man's subscription except himself and the minister nobody was urged to give anything at all all were simply invited to give whatever sum they felt was right and just from ten cents upward and no questions asked no criticisms made no revealments uttered there was no possible chance for glory for even though a man gave his whole fortune nobody would ever know it i do not know when anything has struck me as so utopian so absurdly romantic so ignorant on its face of human nature and so anybody would have thought parties said mr beecher had educated his people and that each would give as he privately felt able and not bother about the glory i believed human nature to be a more potent educator than any minister and that the result would show it but i was wrong at the end of a month or two some two-thirds of the circulars had wended back one by one to the pastor silently and secretly through the post office and then without mentioning the name of any giver or the amount of his gift mr beecher announced from the pulpit that all the money needed was pledged the certain amount being over forty five thousand dollars and the possible amount over fifty three thousand dollars when the remainder of the circulars have come in it is confidently expected and believed that they will add to these amounts a sum of not less than ten thousand dollars a great many subscriptions from children and working men consisted of cash enclosures ranging from a ten cent currency stamp up to five ten and fifteen dollars as i said before the plan of levying the building tax and the success of the plan are much more curious and surprising than the exceedingly curious edifice the money is to create the reason the monies are to be paid in four annual installments for that is the plan 
is partly to make the payments easy, but chiefly because the church is to be substantially built and its several parts allowed time to settle and season each in its turn. For instance, the superstructures will be allowed a good part of the first year to settle and compact themselves after completion, the walls the second year, and so forth and so on. There is to be no work done by contract, and no unseasoned wood used. The materials are to be sound and good, and honest, competent, conscientious workmen, Beecher says there are such, the opinion of the world to the contrary notwithstanding, hired at full wages, by the day, to put them together. The above statements are all true and genuine, according to the oath I have already made thereto and which I am now about to repeat before a notary, in legal form, with my hand upon the book. Consequently, we are going to have at least one sensible, but very, very curious church in America. I am aware that I had no business to tell all these matters, but the reporter instinct was strong upon me, and I could not help it. And besides, they were in everybody's mouth in Elmira anyway. Buffalo, June 1871. End of section 4, July 23, 1871. A real church and a new Beecher church. Read by John Greenman. Section 5 of Mark Twain in the New York Times, Part 1, 1867 to 1879. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain in the New York Times, Part One, Section Five, January twenty fifth, eighteen seventy two. Mark Twain's Lecture, Roughing It, read by John Greenman. Mark Twain's Lecture. Mark Twain delivered a meteorological, historical, topographical, geological, zoological, and comical lecture last night at Steinway Hall for the benefit of his hearers and the Mercantile Library Association. The effort, which seemed to require no effort at all on the part of the humorous storyteller, was all about roughing it out in Nevada, the land of sage-hens, Mexican bloods, mountain sheep, alkaline dust, and duels. The lecturer related his narrative to a crowded house. He was repeatedly applauded, and won the sympathy of the audience when he said that he differed from George Washington, who could not tell a lie. As for me, said Twain, I can, but I won't. The lecture was a decided success, and much gratified all who heard it. End of Section 5, January 25, 1872, Mark Twain's Lecture, Roughing It, read by John Greenman. Section 6 of Mark Twain in the New York Times, Part 1, 1867 to 1879. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain in the New York Times, Part 1, Section 6, November 26, 1872. Perils of the Sea. Read by John Greenman. Perils of the Sea. Dismantling of a British Bark in a Hurricane. Eleven men washed from the wreck and drowned. Sufferings of four others found in the rigging. Mark Twain's account of the rescue of the survivors. Destructive gale on Saturday in the British Channel. Special dispatch to the New York Times. Boston, November 25th. The Cunard steamship Batavia, Captain Moreland, arrived at this port today and reports that on the 19th of November, when in latitude 49 degrees 16 minutes north, longitude 41 degrees 27 minutes west, she fell in with the British bark Charles Ward of Newcastle, England, waterlogged and dismasted in a hurricane on the morning of the 18th, and took off the survivors of the bark's complement of twenty men, the other eleven having been washed off the wreck. Mark Twain, who was a passenger on the Batavia, addresses a communication to the Royal Human Society, giving a detailed account of the wreck, 
and bestowing the warmest praise on the officers of the batavia he says under date wednesday on sunday night a strong west wind began to blow and not long after midnight it increased to a gale by four o'clock the sea was running very high at seven and a half our starboard bulwarks were stove in and the water entered the main saloon at a later hour the gangway on the port side came in with a crash and the sea followed flooding many of the staterooms on that side at the same time a sea crossed the roof of the vessel and carried away one of our boats splintering it to pieces and taking one of the davits with it at nine and a half the glass was down to twenty eight point three five and the gale was blowing with a severity which the officers say is not experienced oftener than once in five or ten years the storm continued during the day and all night and also all day yesterday but with moderated violence at four p m a dismasted vessel was sighted a furious squall had just broken upon us and the sea was running mountains high to use the popular expression nevertheless captain morland immediately bore up for the wreck which was making signals of distress ordered out a lifeboat and called for volunteers to a landsman it seemed like deliberate suicide to go out in such a storm but our third and fourth officers and eight men answered the call with a promptness that compelled a cheer they carried a long line with them several life buoys and a lighted lantern for the atmosphere was murky with the storm and sunset was not far off the wreck a bark was in a pitiful condition her mizzenmast and her bowsprit were gone and her foremast was but a stump wreathed and cumbered with a ruin of sails and cordage from the fallen foretop and foretop gallant masts and yards we could see nine men clinging to the main rigging the stern of the vessel was gone and the sea made a clean breach over her pouring in a cataract out of the broken stern and spouting through the parted planks of her bows our boat pulled three hundred yards and approached the wreck on the lee side then it had a hard fight for the waves and the wind beat it constantly back i do not know when anything has alternately so stirred me through and through and then disheartened me as it did to see the boat every little while get almost close enough and then be hurled three lengths away again by a prodigious wave and the darkness settling down all the time but at last they got the line and buoy aboard and after that we could make out nothing more presently we discovered the boat approaching us and found she had saved every soul nine men they had had to drag these men one at a time through the sea to the lifeboat with the line and buoy for of course they did not dare to touch the plunging vessel with the boat the peril increased now for every time the boat got close to our lee our ship rolled over on her and hid her from sight but our people managed to haul the party aboard one at a time without losing a man though i said they would lose every single one of them i am therefore but a poor success as a prophet as the fury of the squall had not diminished and as the sea was so heavy it was feared we might lose some men if we tried to hoist the lifeboat aboard so she was turned adrift by the captain's order poor thing after helping in such a gallant deed to speak by the log and to be accurate captain morland gave the order to change our ship's course and bear down toward the wreck at four fourteen p m at five and a quarter our ship was under way again with those nine poor devils on board that is to say this admirable thing was done in a tremendous sea and in the face of a hurricane in sixty minutes by the watch and if your honorable society could be moved to give to captain morland and his boat's crew 
that reward which a sailor prizes and covets above all other distinctions the royal humane society's medal the parties whose names are attached to this paper will feel as grateful as if they themselves were the recipients of this great honor the wrecked bark was the charles ward captain bell bound from quebec to scotland with lumber the vessel went over on her beam ends at nine o'clock monday morning and eleven men were washed overboard and lost captain bell and eight men remained and these our boat saved they had been in the main rigging some thirty-one hours without food or water and were so frozen and exhausted that when we got them aboard they could hardly speak and the minds of several of them were wandering the wreck was out of the ordinary track of vessels and was fifteen hundred miles from land she was in the center of the atlantic our lifeboat crew of volunteers consisted of the following d gillies third officer r kyle fourth officer nicholas foley quartermaster henry foley quartermaster nathaniel clark quartermaster thomas henry seaman john park seaman richard brennan seaman after speaking of the enthusiasm of the passengers mark twain continues as might have been anticipated if i have been of any service toward rescuing these nine shipwrecked human beings by standing around the deck in a furious storm without any umbrella keeping an eye on things and seeing that they were done right and yelling whenever a cheer seemed to be the important thing i am glad and i am satisfied i ask no reward i would do it again under the same circumstances but what i do plead for earnestly and sincerely is that the royal humane society will remember our captain and our lifeboat crew and in so remembering them increase the high honor and esteem in which the society is held all over the civilized world in this appeal our passengers all join with hearty sincerity and in testimony thereof will sign their names begging that you will pardon me a stranger for addressing your honored society with such confidence and such absence of ceremony and trusting that my motive may redeem my manner i am gentlemen your obedient servant signed mark twain samuel l clemens hartford connecticut here follow the names of all the passengers among whom were sidney d palmer and mr and mrs e g moss of new york and james hall state geologist of albany mr clemens was chairman of the committee on address and c c walworth of the meeting of passengers mr clemens wrote a characteristic address which was delivered to captain morland end of section six november twenty sixth eighteen seventy two Perils of the Sea, read by John Greenman. Section 7 of Mark Twain in the New York Times, Part 1, 1867 to 1879. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain at the New York Times, Part 1, Section 7, February 6, 1873. Mark Twain's Lecture on the Sandwich Islands. Review. Read by John Greenman. Mark Twain's Lecture on the Sandwich Islands. The inimitable Mark Twain delivered his lecture on the Sandwich Islands last night at Steinway Hall for the benefit of the Mercantile Library Association. The hall and balconies were crowded to excess. Every seat was occupied, and the center and side passages were literally packed with persons who could not procure seats. The lecturer, on being introduced, assured the audience that he felt himself fully competent to speak of the interesting locality to which public attention has been lately directed, having spent several months on the islands. They were situated about 2,100 miles southwest of San Francisco, 
but why they were put in such an out-of-the-way locality he never could ascertain the geological structure of the group of islands was described in the dry caustic style for which twain is celebrated the visit of the whites introduced civilization and education and killed out the natives the latest reliable information fixes the population at fifty thousand and when the benevolent foreigners start a few more seminaries it is to be hoped that that event will materially help to kill off the remainder of the native population the females wear a long robe the gentlemen generally wear a smile and a pair of spectacles the humorous description of the king and nobility kept the audience convulsed with laughter it was not to be supposed that the natives were ignorant of scripture history that they had some idea of the fall of eve mr twain proved by stating that it was death for a woman to eat any fruit of the island probably they did not wish to give woman a second chance the american missionary society had started schools and introduced printing and owing to their exertions there was not a single uneducated native above eighteen years old on the island and the nation was about the best educated in the world the expense of the mission was paid by the sunday school children of america and mr twain mentioned the fact that some thirty years ago he invested two dollars in the speculation of course he did not mind the money nor did he wish to show off the incident was referred to as an instance of confiding humanity and he hoped it would have its effect on the house the natives are very hospitable and feast their guests on roast dog and fricasseed cat the ordinary american sausage stripped of its mystery the dog was the pet of the household and the constant companion of the family and when fit for the table was killed and served up mr twain had no decided objection to the dish but he did not relish the idea of eating a personal friend there were no cannibals to the sandwich islands true one addicted to that barbarous custom settled on one of the group and getting tired of digesting natives he resolved to try a white man with onions this savage succeeded in capturing the captain of a whaling ship a tough old salt who had spent fifty years at sea living on shark steaks and blubber but he proved too much for the digestive organs of the interesting native and he died of the feast with the crime on his conscience and the whaler in his stomach the various peculiarities of the kanaks were described by mr twain who interspersed his discourse with humorous sketches and witty allusions to the topics of the day which kept his audience in a continuous roar of laughter his attitudes gestures and looks even his very silence were provocative of mirth the lecture will be repeated on monday evening end of section seven february sixth eighteen seventy three mark twain's lecture on the sandwich islands review read by john greenman section eight of mark twain in the new york times part one eighteen sixty seven to eighteen seventy nine this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain in the new york times part one section eight june eleventh eighteen seventy three mark twain an interesting question in trademark the innocent at law read by john greenman an interesting question in trademark the innocent at law in supreme court chambers yesterday before chief justice ingraham an interesting question came up as to the right of an author to the exclusive use of his nom de plume as a trademark a short time since on the application of mr simon stern counsel for samuel l clemens known as mark twain a temporary injunction was granted restraining j b such from publishing a certain advertising medium in the form of a book entitled fun fact and fancy yesterday argument was had on the return of the order to show cause why the injunction should not be made permanent 
It appeared from the affidavit of Mark, and argument of his counsel, that about a month since the defendant applied to him to write a sketch for an advertising pamphlet the applicant was about to publish, offering therefore one thousand dollars, or as much more as was asked, defendant stating that other prominent authors and humorists had agreed to contribute. Mark informed the stranger that he was too busy to do so, but offered to assist him so far as to give him permission to publish any one of several sketches which he then and there marked in a printed volume of his sketches. About a month subsequently, while traveling by the Erie Railway, on his way to take steamer for Europe, Mark had a book thrust upon him by the newsboy, containing five of his sketches, and on the title page the following, revised and selected for this work by Mark Twain. Having no connection with the book, other than as already stated, this method of treatment, after his liberality, aroused the ire of the innocent, and the present suit was the result. It is claimed on behalf of the plaintiff that he has a vested right, as against all the world, in his nom de plume, Mark Twain, that such right is guaranteed to him by the laws relating to trademark, and that defendant, and all parties claiming through or under him, should be perpetually restrained from the use thereof. After an elaborate argument by Mr. Simon Stern on behalf of plaintiff, and Mr. Charles Matthews on the part of defendant, Judge Ingraham took the papers, saying he would render a decision in a few days. End of section 8, June 11, 1873, Mark Twain, An Interesting Question in Trademark, The Innocent at Law. Read by John Greenman. Section 9 of Mark Twain in the New York Times, Part 1, 1867 to 1879. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain in the New York Times, Part 1, Section 9. June 12, 1873. Mark Twain's suit. He obtains a permanent injunction. Read by John Greenman. Mark Twain's suit. He obtains a permanent injunction. In the case of Samuel L. Clemens, known as Mark Twain, against Benjamin J. Such, to restrain by injunction the publication of a book containing some of the former sketches, and purporting to have been revised by him, the facts of which appeared in yesterday's times, Chief Justice Ingraham has ordered a permanent injunction to issue against the defendant. In a brief memorandum endorsed on the papers in the case, the Chief Justice says, the sketches were the property of plaintiff, and he is entitled to an order restraining their publication without his consent. The agreement only contemplated the use of one sketch, and there was no authority to publish that one as revised by the author. End of section 9, June 12, 1873. Mark Twain's suit. He obtains a permanent injunction. Read by John Greenman. Section 10 of Mark Twain in the New York Times, Part 1, 1867 to 1879. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain in the New York Times, Part 1, Section 10, September 17, 1874. Amusements, Park Theater. Read by John Greenman. Amusements, Park Theater. Mark Twain's drama, called The Gilded Age, was represented at this house last evening. The Gilded Age is a play dealing with possible incidents of American life, and in which none but American characters move. We have recorded so many unsuccessful efforts to produce a passable piece of this sort that we confess to having awaited Mr. Twain's performance with a very slight anticipation of its excellence. It disappointed us, we are glad to say, most agreeably. The Gilded Age is by no means a model drama, but it enfolds a tolerably interesting story, several scenes of which might be acted off the stage, and some personages whose traits are no more exaggerated than is necessary for their effectiveness upon the audience. 
a large assemblage witnessed its recital and accorded to it attention and applause the plot of the gilded age is of extreme simplicity it sets forth plainly that colonel george selby a married man has seduced laura hawkins and that the young lady as the prototype supplied by recent american history soon afterward kills her seducer and goes unpunished there is sufficient dramatic force in these events for the framework in which the minor transactions of the play are bound and out of them grows at least one impressive picture the slaying of colonel selby by laura hawkins certainly it is however that the gilded age pleased chiefly on account of a character not at all essential to the main story the comicalities of colonel sellers kept the spectators merry throughout the whole four acts this personage has been compared to micawber but micawber's imagination is feeble compared to that of colonel sellers and for breadth and rosiness the plans developed by the western settler are literally unprecedented utterly insane as some of colonel sellers theories appeared everybody present recognized that in real life colonel sellers has many relatives as visionary and as sanguine as he and the occasional touches of nature proved as always very potent mr john raymond assumed this role with an earnestness which ensured his success he evidently deceived himself with his splendid projects more thoroughly than he managed to deceive the most credulous of his listeners and the perfect heartiness of all his speeches together with the absence of self-consciousness in his wildest eccentricities rendered his personation as artistic as it was striking the merriment was loud and continuous the interest of the serious transactions of the night would have been much heightened had the company been more efficient the one trying scene in the gilded age however was exceedingly well performed by miss gertrude kellogg frequent plaudits interrupted the representation in an intermission of which mr twain was summoned before the curtain whence he delivered an address that afforded considerable amusement the gilded age remains on the bills until further notice end of section ten september seventeenth eighteen seventy four amusements park theatre read by john greenman Section 11 of Mark Twain in the New York Times, Part 1, 1867 to 1879. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain in the New York Times, Part 1, Section 11, November 29, 1874, Sociable Jimmy, read by John Greenman. Sociable Jimmy. I sent the following home in a private letter some time ago from a certain little village. It was in the days when I was a public lecturer. I did it because I wished to preserve the memory of the most artless, sociable, and exhaustless talker I ever came across. He did not tell me a single remarkable thing, or one that was worth remembering, and yet he was himself so interested in his small marvels and they flowed so naturally and comfortably from his lips that his talk got the upper hand of my interest too and i listened as one who receives a revelation i took down what he had to say just as he said it without altering a word or adding one i had my supper in my room this evening as usual and they sent up a bright, simple, guileless little darky boy to wait on me, ten years old, a wide-eyed, observant little chap. I said, What is your name, my boy? They calls me Jimmy, sir, but right name's James, sir. I said, Sit down there, Jimmy. I'll not want you just yet. He sat down in a big arm chair hung both his legs over one of the arms, and looked comfortable and conversational. I said, Did you have a pleasant Christmas, Jimmy? No, sir, not exactly. 
I was kind of sick then. But the rest of people, they had a good time. Most all of them had a good time. They all got drunk. They all gets drunk here every Christmas and carries on as, as awful good times. So you were sick and lost it all. But unless you were very sick, I should think that if you had asked the doctor, he might have let you get to get a little drunk and oh no sir i don't never get drunk it's de white folks them's de ones i mean pa used to get drunk but that was before i was big but he's done quit he don't get drunk no more now just takes one sip in the morning now cause his stomach riles up he sleeps so sound just one sip over to the saloon every morning he's powerful sickly powerful Sometimes can't hardly get around, he can't. He goes to the doctor every week over to Ragtown, and one time he took some stuff, you know, and it might have near fetched him. Ain't it dish yer blue vittles that's pison? Ain't that it? Truck what you pisons cats with? Yes, uh, blue vittles, vitriol, is a very convincing article with a cat. Well, then, that was it. The old man, he tucked the bottle and shook it and shook it. He seed it was blue, and he didn't know, but it was blue mass, which he tucked most always, blue mass pills. But then he expected maybe dish here truck might be some other kind of old blue stuff. And so he sat the bottle down and, and tried if it weren't blue vittles shown off when the doctor come. And the doctor, he say, if he had tucked that blue vittles, it would have heisted him, sure. People can't be too particular about such things. Yes, indeedy. We ain't got no cats here about this hotel. Bill, he don't like em. He can't stand a cat no way. If he was to catch one, he'd slam it out in the winder in a minute. Yes, he would. Bill's down on cats. So is the gals, waiter gals. When they catches a cat bum around here, they just scoops em. Deed they do. They snake him into the cistern. They's been cats drowned in that water that's in your pitcher. I see the cat in there yesterday, all swelled up like a puddin'. I bet you dem gals done that. Ma says if they was to drown the cat for her, the first one of em she ketched, she'd jam her into the cistern long with the cat. Ma wouldn't do that, I don't reckon. But deed and double, she said she would. I can't kill a chicken. Well, I can wring its neck off, cause that don't make em no sufferings ghastly, but I can't take and chop the heads off, like some people can. Makes me feel so, so, well, I can see that chicken night so I can't sleep. Mr. Dunlap, he's the richest man in this town. Some people says there's four thousand people in this town, this city. But Bill says, ain't but bout thirty-three hundred. And Bill, he knows, cause he's lived here all his life, though they do say he won't never set the river on fire. I don't know how they find out. I wouldn't like to count all them people. Some folks says this town would be considerable bigger if it weren't on accounts of so much land all round it that ain't got no houses on it. This in perfect seriousness. Dense simplicity. No idea of a joke. I reckon you see that church as you come along up street. That's an awful big church, awful high steeple, and it's all solid stone, except just the top part, the steeple, I means. That's wood. It falls off when the wind blows pooty hard, and one time it stuck in a cow's back and busted the cow all to mischief. It's going to kill somebody, it, that steeple is. A man, big man he was, bigger than what Bill is, he tuck it up there and fixed it again, and he didn't look no bigger than a boy, he was so high up. That steeple's awful high. If you look out the window, you can see it. I looked out and was speechless with awe and admiration, which gratified Jimmy beyond expression. Wonderful steeple was some sixty or seventy feet high and had a clock face on it. You see that arrow on top of that steeple? Well, sir. That air is pooty high as big as this door. Door. I seed it when they pulled it out in the cow. 
it must be awful to stand in that steeple when the clock is striking they say it is booms and jars so you think the world's got coming to an end i wouldn't like to be up there when the clocks are striking and that clock ain't just a striker like these common clocks it's a bell it's the regular bell and it's a buster you can hear that bell all over this city you ought to hear it boom 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 when days a fire uh, my sakes they ain't got no bell like that in ragtown i've been to ragtown i've been most halfway to dockery thirty miles de bell in ragtown's got so old now she don't make no sound scarcely enter the landlord a kindly man verging toward fifty my small friend without changing position says bill didn't you say that they was only thirty three hundred people in this city yes about thirty three hundred is the population now well some folks says they's four thousand yes i know they do but it isn't correct bill i don't think this gentleman can eat a whole prairie chicken but he told me to fetch it all up yes that's right he ordered it exit bill leaving me comfortable for i had been perishing to know who bill was bill he's the oldest and he's the best too they's fourteen in this family all boys and gals bill he spotes them all and he done never complain he's real good bill is all them brothers and sisters of his ain't no account all cept that little teeny one that fetched in that milk that's kit sah she ain't only nine year old but she's the most ladylike one in the whole billin you don't never see kit a-ririn and a-chargin round and kickin up her heels like the rest of the gals in this family does generally that was nan that you hearin cuttin dem shines on piano a while ago and sometimes she don't rassle that piano when she gets started tab can't hold a candle to her but tab can sing like de very nation she's the only one in this family that can sing you don't never hear a yelp out in nan nan can't sing for shucks i just leaves here a tomcat that's got scalded Days fourteen in this family, sides the old man and the old woman, all brothers and sisters. But some of em don't live here, though Bill he sports them, lends em money, and pays debts, and helps em long. Tell you, Bill, he's real good. They all gets drunk, all except Bill. The old man, he gets drunk too, same as the rest of em. Bob, he don't get drunk much, just sloshes round the saloon some, and takes a dram sometimes bob he's next to bill bout forty years old they's all married all the family's married cept some of de gals there's fourteen it's the biggest family in these parts they say there's bill bill nubbles nubbles is de name bill and grig and duke and bob and nan and tab and kit and sol and si and phil and puss and jake and sal sal she's married and got chillin as big as eyes and and hoss nubbles he's the lass hoss is what they most always call him but he's got another name that i somehow disremember it's so kind of hard to get the hang of it then observing that i had been taking down the extraordinary list of nicknames for adults he said but in the morning i can ask bill what's hoss's other name and then i'll come up and tell you when i fetches your breakfast and maybe i done got some of them names mixed up but bill he can tell me days fourteen by this time he was starting off with the waiter and a pecuniary consideration for his sociability and as he went out he paused a moment and said dad fetch it somehow that other name don't come but anyways you just read them names over and see if day's fourteen i read the list from the fly-leaf of longfellow's new england tragedies that's right sah day's all down i'll fetch up hoss's other name in the mornin', sah don't you be uneasy exit whistling listen to the mockingbird end of section eleven november twenty ninth eighteen seventy four sociable jimmy read by john greenman
Section 12 of Mark Twain in the New York Times, Part 1, 1867-1879. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain in the New York Times, Part 1, Section 12, December 24, 1874, Amusements, the 100th Representation of The Gilded Age, read by John Greenman. Amusements, the 100th Representation of the Gilded Age. The Park Theatre was literally crammed from pit to dome last evening on the occasion of the 100th representation of Mark Twain's American drama of the Gilded Age. The interest which of late has been associated with the effort to establish a purely American drama representing American character in its various existing phases, and racy of the soil, has centered around the production of The Gilded Age and the success of the play has been a cause of general gratification. Since its first recital, the piece has received every evidence of public appreciation, and the quaint eccentricities of good-natured and wildly speculative Colonel Sellers, with his visionary schemes for the creation of millions, have secured for themselves a permanent place in the memory of theatre-goers. The performance last evening was distinguished by several novel features, and bouquets and satin programs were distributed in celebration of the occasion. The piece was played as usual, and in response to repeated calls, the author, Mr. Samuel L. Clemens, better known as Mark Twain, delivered an address, replete with humor in speech and gesture. He warmly expressed his sense of gratitude for the public appreciation of the play, and on retiring he was loudly cheered. Mr. John T. Raymond also expressed the gratitude of the actors for the recognition their efforts to please had received, and generously attributed the success of the piece not to any merit of his own, but to the excellence inherent to the play itself. After the fourth act, Mark Twain was called before the curtain and was loudly applauded. He said, "'Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for this call for it gives me an opportunity to testify my appreciation of the vast compliment which the metropolis has paid to Mr. Raymond and me in approving of our efforts to the very substantial extent of filling this house for us a hundred nights in succession. After such praise as this from the first city in the land, it would be useless for me to try to pretend that we are not feeling a good deal set up, so I shall not pretend anything of the kind. We feel a good deal vainer than anybody would want to confess. Laughter. I learned through the newspapers that I was to make a speech here tonight and so I went hard to work, as I always do, to try and do the very best I possibly could on this occasion. I was determined to do it. I went at it faithfully, but when I came to look critically into this matter, I found that I shouldered a pretty heavy contract. Laughter. I found I shouldered a very heavy contract because there is only one topic that is proper to be discussed on this platform at this time, and that is this play, and these actors, and all the success which this play has met. Very well, that is an excellent subject for somebody else. Laughter. It is right for an outsider or for somebody not connected with the concern but for me, the dramatist, to praise these actors of mine, to praise this play of mine, and this success of ours, that would not come gracefully from me. There would be a little egotism in it. Neither can I criticize and abuse the actors, for I don't want to. I could abuse the play, but I have better judgment laughter and applause, and I cannot praise these actors of mine right here in their hearing and before their faces, 
for that would make anybody with flesh and blood unhappy, and, indeed, to praise them would be like praising the members of my own family and glorifying the lady who does our washing. Laughter. And the more I think of this matter, the more I see the difficulty of the position, until I find myself in a condition I once before experienced. Mr. Twain here recited from his published work, Roughing It, the sketch, A Genuine Mexican Plug, in a spirit of dry humor which convulsed the audience with laughter. The incident referred to was his unhappy experience with a Mexican horse in which he came to grief. Through that adventure, he continued, through the misfortune I lost the faculty of speech. For twenty-four hours I was absolutely speechless, and this is the second time that that has occurred. Applause. Mr. John T. Raymond, the Colonel Sellers of the piece, was loudly called before the curtain. He quickly appeared with the expression of Sellers when proclaiming a prospective gain of millions, and his manner provoked much merriment. He said, Ladies and gentlemen, after acting one hundred nights in this house, I don't feel like playing a new part and playing it badly, which I certainly should if I attempted to say I was not very much pleased at the reception you have given me. It is not a very grateful or easy task to try to be funny or witty after Mr. Twain, but any man would be happy on such an occasion as this, and after what you have done for me, why should I not be happy? I want to thank you for a great many things, but especially for your constant appreciation of my efforts to please. Of one thing I can assure you, that Mr. Twain's play would not have amounted to much if he had not found a man to act the part and other men to appreciate it. Laughter. That was such a success I don't know what next to say. A laugh. But I want to thank you over and over again for your kind recognition of our labors. The success of this piece is due to the management of the theater, and I beg here to publicly thank Messrs. Stewart and Fulton for their efforts to do everything toward the success of the play. Applause. The Little Park Theater is now one of the institutions of the city, and I am heartily glad of it for Mr. Stewart's sake. He deserves it, and I trust that Colonel Sellers will be one of the institutions of your country, and if the people of the United States treat me half as well as you have done, I am perfectly satisfied it will be all right. Once more, let me thank you. Let me extend my sincere acknowledgments to the genius who conceived the character of Colonel Sellers, to the generous public who have welcomed it, and to the press which has recognized so liberally all our efforts to give proper effect to American character and place it on a self-sustaining basis. Applause. Mr. Raymond was retiring when a bottle of Colonel Sellers' famous oriental optical eye-water was presented to him. He took it and said, Take it internally, externally, and eternally, and there is millions in it. Laughter and applause. Mr. Stewart, the manager, was also called for, but did not appear, and the performance then continued. End of section 12, December 24, 1874 Amusements, the 100th Representation of the Gilded Age, read by John Greenman. Section 13 of Mark Twain in the New York Times, Part 1, 1867 to 1879. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain in the New York Times, Part 1, Section 13, April 29, 1875. Proposed Shakespearean Memorial, read by John Greenman. Proposed Shakespearean Memorial. 
to the editor of the New York Times. I have just received a letter from an English friend of mine whose hospitality I enjoyed some days at his house in Stratford-on-Avon, and I feel sure that the matter he writes about will interest Americans. He encloses a circular, which I will insert in this place. A preliminary committee was recently formed for the purpose of ascertaining the possibility of carrying out the project of a Shakespeare Memorial Theatre in Stratford-on-Avon, the old theatre in the town having been purchased and pulled down by Mr. J. O. Hallowell Phillips for the purpose of restoring the site to new place and completing those gardens. A meeting was held at the town hall on Monday to receive the committee's report. Sir Robert N. C. Hamilton, Bart, K.C.B., was in the chair. The Honorable Secretary, Mr. C. E. Flower, stated that the proposal had been most favorably received, and the committee recommended that the theater should be erected by subscription and any sum raised beyond the amount required for the building, and any profit realized by the rental on ordinary occasions to be applied after defraying the necessary expenses of the establishment, to the celebration of the anniversary of the poet's birthday, and to the promotion and improvement of legitimate acting, by the establishment of prizes for essays upon the subject, lectures, and ultimately a dramatic training school or college. The building to be erected upon a site which has been given for the purpose, the surrounding ground from which beautiful views of the church and the river can be obtained, to be laid out as ornamental gardens. Connected with the theater, the committee also recommended that a library and saloon or gallery intended to receive pictures and statuary of Shakespearean subjects, several of which have been already promised, should be provided. Donors of one hundred pounds and upward to be governors and managers of the property. The governors to meet annually and vote personally or by proxy for the election of the executive council and frame rules for the general management of the memorial property and funds. For convenience of administration, the association to be incorporated under Section 23 of the Companies Act, 1867, for associations formed not for profit but for the promotion of science, art, etc. The report was unanimously adopted. A list of promised donations to the amount of two thousand five hundred and sixty three pounds ten shillings was read and generous offers from managers and members of the theatrical profession of free performances were announced subscriptions of the smallest amount will be received and it is hoped that a truly appropriate memorial to shakespeare in his native town will receive the support of many in all parts of the world who have received instruction and pleasure from his works. By another circular I perceive that this project, young as it is, is already becoming popular, for no less than twenty-two lovers of Shakespeare have come forward with their one hundred pounds apiece, and assumed the dignity of governors of the Memorial Theatre. In this list I find the following. Creswick, the actor, F. B. Chatterton, of the Drury Lane, London, Benjamin Webster, of the Adelphi, London, Buxton, the comedian, and Mr. Southern. I now come to my point, which will be found in this extract from my English friend's letter. You may possibly remember some timber wharves on the Avon above my garden. These I have bought and given for a site for a memorial theatre. I think it possible that some Americans who have visited Stratford might be able and feel inclined to become governors, that is, one hundred pound shareholders, in the memorial theatre and grounds, and that others not so well off might like to contribute smaller sums to help beautify it. 
therefore he asks me to make the suggestion in point here and i very gladly do it i think the mere suggestion is all that is necessary we are not likely to be backward when called upon to do honor to shakespeare one of the circulars says subscriptions can be paid to the shakespeare memorial fund at the old bank stratford upon avon and will be invested in the names of sir r n c hamilton bart and c e flower esq who have consented to act as trustees until the registration is completed will you sir undertake to receive and forward the american subscriptions or if not will you kindly name some responsible person who will do it i believe that americans of every walk in life will cheerfully subscribe to this shakespeare memorial i think that some of our prominent actors i could almost name them will come forward and enroll themselves as governors i think our commercial millionaires and literary people will not be slow to take governorships or at least come as near as they feel able and i think it altogether likely that many of our theatres like those of england will give it a benefit americans have already subscribed one thousand pounds for an american memorial window to be put in the shakespeare church at avon about three-fourths of the visitors to shakespeare's tomb are americans if you will show me any american who has visited england and has not seen that tomb barnum shall be on his track next week it was an american who roused into its present vigorous life england's dead interest in her shakespearean remains think of that imagine the house that shakespeare was born in being brought bodily over here and set up on american soil that came within an ace of being done once a reputable gentleman of stratford told me so the old building was going to wreck and ruin nobody felt quite reverence enough for the dead dramatist to repair and take care of his house so an american came along ever so quietly and bought it the deeds were actually drawn and ready for the signatures then the thing got wind and there was a fine stir in england the sale was stopped public-spirited englishmen headed a revival of reverence for the poet and from that day to this every relic of shakespeare in stratford has been sacred and zealously cared for accordingly can you name the american who once owned shakespeare's birthplace for twenty-four hours there is but one who could ever have conceived of such a an unique and ingenious enterprise and he is the man i refer to p t barnum we had to lose the house but let us not lose the present opportunity to help him build the memorial theater mark twain hartford monday april twenty sixth eighteen seventy five end of section thirteen april twenty ninth eighteen seventy five proposed shakespeare memorial read by john greenman section fourteen of mark twain in the new york times part one eighteen sixty seven to eighteen seventy nine this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain in the new york times part one section fourteen october first eighteen seventy five a persistent beggar mark twain relates his experiences with a professor of the art read by john greenman a persistent beggar mark twain relates his experiences with a professor of the art mark twain in a letter to the hartford current relates his experiences with a professor of the begging art and offers a solicitor for a southern educational project a first-rate opportunity to prove the merits of his cause he says to the editor of the current sir i have been unjust to a stranger today, or unfaithful to my duty as a citizen i cannot yet determine which i wish now to write that stranger if i have wronged him and i wish also to retrieve my citizenship 
here are the facts in the case yesterday evening while i was at dinner a card was brought to me bearing the inscription professor a b i said i do not know the professor ask him to excuse me and if he should chance to call again tell him to drop me a line through the post office and state his business experience has taught me that strangers never call upon a man with any other desire than to sell him a lightning rod and experience has also taught me that if you suggest the post to these parties they respect your sagacity and do not trouble you any more but the professor called again this morning at ten o'clock and sent up a couple of documents documents so conspicuously dirty that it would be only fair and right to tax them as real estate one of these papers was a petition for aid to establish a school in a southern state the petitioner justifying his appeal upon the ground that he had suffered for his union sentiments in that state during the war the supplication was signed a b late candidate for the legislature of said state it seemed to me that of all the mild honors i had ever heard of men claiming that of defeated candidate for legislative distinction was certainly the mildest peering into the dirt of this paper i perceived through the rich gloom a string of names with ten dollars twenty five dollars fifty dollars one hundred dollars and other sums set opposite them several were well-known hartford names others were familiar new york names a few seemed to be autograph signatures the rest not hon peter cooper was down for a generous sum so also was hon w c bryant both in a foreign hand just think of the idea of trying to add dignity to the old poet's name by sticking that paltry on to it i turned to the late candidate's other soiled document it was a letter sheet with half a dozen grimy notices from village newspapers pasted on it these were all highly complimentary to hon a b the great english elocutionist and reader there was also gratuitous mention of the smallness of one of the audience he had enchanted a remark which might as well have been left out i said to myself last night this person was professor a b in his petition he is late candidate for a legislature when he travels as the great english elocutionist he is hon a b what he is professor of does not appear he does not account for his title of honorable for merely running for that dazzling legislative position does not confer the title he could not have brought it from england for only certain officials and the younger sons of noblemen are permitted to use it there and if he belonged to either of those lists he is not the person to forget to mention it about this time my cold in the head gave my temper a wrench and i said go and tell the professor i don't wish to invest in his educational stock now there is where i acted precipitately and failed of my duty either as a citizen or toward this stranger i ought to have looked into his case a little by jumping to the conclusion that he was a fraud i may possibly have wronged him if he is a fraud i ought to have proved it on him and exposed him that being the plain duty of a citizen in such cases very well having committed this error i now wish to retrieve it so i make the following proposition to mr a b to wit that he send me that list of names again so that i can write to the parties and inquire if they ever gave those sums and if they did what proofs they had of a b s worthiness that he refer me to reputable persons in that southern state to the end that i may inquire of them concerning his history there not that i wish to inquire into his late candidacy for i think that 
when a man has unsuccessfully aspired to be a legislator and is capable of mentioning it where people could not otherwise find it out he is manifestly telling the petrified truth that he refer me to a trustworthy authority who can inform me how he got the title of professor how he got the title of honorable and what the name of his english birthplace is so that i can have this parish register examined these data being furnished me and i finding by means of them that a b is not an impostor i will take stock in his school and also furnish him a certificate of character which shall be signed by some of the best men of hartford a certificate which shall far outvalue his present lame documents but if a b s references shall fail to establish his worthiness i will publish him and also try to procure his arrest as a vagrant i will assist a b all i can by enclosing copies of his article to mr austin dunham mr william e dodge mr bryant mr peter cooper messrs arnold constable and company and other parties in his list including the officials of the southern city he mentions to the end that they may quickly testify in his favor if they can i remember now that a b called on me just a year ago and that he was then adding to his name the imperishable glory of late candidate etc mark twain end of section fourteen october first eighteen seventy five a persistent beggar read by john greenman section fifteen of mark twain in the new york times part one eighteen sixty seven to eighteen seventy nine this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain in the new york times part one section fifteen december ninth eighteen seventy five mark twain's contribution read by john greenman mark twain's contribution a book of autographs offered for sale at the massachusetts infant asylum fair in boston contains a letter from mark twain which reads hartford october fifth eighteen seventy five dear madam i beg to wish the best success and a long career of usefulness to the infant asylum fair but words are empty deeds are what show the earnest spirit therefore i am willing to be one of a thousand citizens who shall agree to contribute two or more of their children to this enterprise i do not make this offer in order that i may appear gaudy or lavish in the eyes of the world but only to help a worthy cause to the best of my ability very truly yours samuel l clemens mark twain end of section fifteen december ninth eighteen seventy five mark twain's contribution read by john greenman section sixteen of mark twain in the new york times part one eighteen sixty seven eighteen seventy nine this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain in the new york times part one section sixteen march nineteenth eighteen seventy six mark twain on st patrick read by john greenman mark twain on st patrick the following letter was read at the supper of the knights of st patrick in hartford connecticut on friday night hartford march sixteenth richard mcleod esq dear sir i am very sorry that i cannot be with the knights of st patrick tomorrow evening in this centennial year we ought all to find a peculiar pleasure in doing honor to the memory of a man whose good name has endured through fourteen centuries we ought to find pleasure in it for the reason that at this time we naturally have a fellow feeling for such a man he wrought a great work in his day 
he found ireland a prosperous republic and looked about him to see if he might find some useful thing to turn his hand to he observed that the president of that republic was in the habit of sheltering his great officials from deserved punishment so he lifted up his staff and smote him and he died he found that the secretary of war had been so unbecomingly economical as to have laid up twelve thousand dollars a year out of a salary of eight thousand dollars and he killed him he found that the secretary of the interior always prayed over every separate and distinct barrel of salt beef that was intended for the unconverted savage and then kept that beef himself so he killed him also he found that the secretary of the navy knew more about handling suspicious claims than he did about handling a ship and he at once made an end of him he found that a very foul private secretary had been engineered through a sham trial so he destroyed him he discovered that the congress which pretended to prodigious virtue was very anxious to investigate an ambassador who had dishonored the country abroad but was equally anxious to prevent the appointment of any spotless man to a similar post that this congress had no god but party no system of morals but party policy no vision but a bat's vision and no reason or excuse for existing anyhow therefore he massacred that congress to the last man when he finished his great work he said in his figuratively way lo i have destroyed all the reptiles in ireland st patrick had no politics his sympathies lay with the right that was politics enough when he came across a reptile he forgot to inquire whether he was a democrat or a republican but simply exalted his staff and let him have it honored be his name i wish we had him here to trim us up for the centennial but that cannot be his staff which was the symbol of real not sham reform is idle however we still have with us the symbol of truth george washington's little hatchet for i know they've buried it yours truly s l clemens end of section sixteen march nineteenth eighteen seventy six mark twain on st patrick read by john greenman section seventeen of mark twain in the new york times part one eighteen sixty seven to eighteen seventy nine this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain in the new york times part one section seventeen october second eighteen seventy six mark twain in politics read by john greenman mark twain in politics he presides at a great republican meeting at hartford he thinks it a time for literary men to come out from their studies and work for hayes and wheeler special dispatch to the new york times hartford october first the republican meeting in this city last night was great both in attendance and enthusiasm beforehand there was a fine torchlight parade of boys in blue the meeting was presided over by samuel l clemens mark twain it was his introduction on the political rostrum and he was received with much favor he spoke as follows ladies and gentlemen i feel very greatly honored in being chosen to preside at this meeting this employment is new to me i never have taken any part in a political canvass before except to vote the tribe of which i am the humblest member the literary tribe is one which is not given to bothering about politics but 
there are times when even the strangest departures are justified and such a season i take it is the present canvas someone asked me the other day why it was that nearly all the people who write books and magazines had lately come to the front and proclaimed their political preference since such a thing had probably never occurred before in america and why it was that almost all of this strange new band of volunteers marched under the banner of hayes and wheeler i think these people have come to the front mainly because they think they see at last a chance to make this government a good government because they think they see a chance to institute an honest and sensible system of civil service which will so amply prove its worth and worthiness that no succeeding president can ever venture to put his foot upon it our present civil system born of general jackson and the democratic party is so idiotic so contemptible so grotesque that it would make the very savages of dahomey jeer and the very gods of solemnity laugh we will not hire a blacksmith who never lifted a sledge we will not hire a schoolteacher who does not know the alphabet we will not have a man about us in our business life in any walk of life low or high unless he has served an apprenticeship and can prove that he is capable of doing the work he offers to do we even require a plumber to know something laughter and a pause by the speaker about his business renewed laughter so that he shall at least know which side of a pipe is the inside roars of laughter but when you come to our civil service we serenely fill great numbers of our minor public offices with ignoramuses we put the vast business of a custom house in the hands of a flathead who does not know a bill of lading from a transit of venus laughter and a pause never having heard of either of them before laughter under a treasury appointment we pour oceans of money and accompanying statistics through the hands and brain of an ignorant villager who never before could wrestle with a two weeks wash bill without getting thrown great laughter under our consular system we send creatures all over the world who speak no language but their own and even when it comes to that go wading all their days through the floods of moods and tenses and flourishing the scalps of mutilated parts of speech when forced to it we order home a foreign ambassador who is frescoed all over with with uh, with uh, indiscreetnesses laughter but we immediately send one in his place whose moral ceiling has a perceptible shady tint to it and then he brays when we supposed he was going to roar we carefully train and educate our naval officers and military men and we ripen and perfect their capabilities through long service and experience and keep hold of these excellent servants through a just system of promotion this is exactly what we hope to do with our civil service under mr hayes applause we hope and expect to sever that service as utterly from politics as is the naval and military service and we hope to make it as respectable too we hope to make worth and 
capacity the sole requirements of the civil service in the place of the amount of party dirty work the candidate has done by the time general hawley has finished his speech i think you will know why we in this matter put our trust in hayes in preference to any other man i am not going to say anything about our candidates for state offices because you know them honor them and will vote for them but general hawley being comparatively a stranger i will say a single word in commendation of him and it will furnish one of the many reasons why i am going to vote for him for congress i ask you to look seriously and thoughtfully at just one almost incredible fact general hawley in his official capacity as president of the centennial commission has done one thing which you may not have heard commented upon and yet it is one of the most astounding performances of this decade an act almost impossible perhaps to any other public officer in this nation general hawley has taken as high as one hundred and twenty one thousand dollars gate money at the centennial in a single day and never stole a cent of it great laughter and long continued applause general hawley then spoke for about an hour and a half making a very effective speech and covering all the leading points of the campaign it was one of the most powerful speeches he has ever made here he spoke in new britain the home of congressman langer the night before and while being escorted by the boys in blue the procession was stoned and the color-bearer alone was struck nine times alluding to this outrage general hawley in summing up the reasons why the mission of the republican party was not ended said that it would not end till it was possible not only in the south for men to exercise all the right of citizenship without interference but possible also for republicans in hartford county and connecticut to peruse a peaceable march and he added we will have this right in connecticut if we have to march the whole state through to secure it and this declaration was greeted with prolonged applause end of section seventeen october second eighteen seventy six mark twain in politics read by john greenman section eighteen of mark twain in the new york times part one eighteen sixty seven to eighteen seventy nine this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain in the new york times part one section eighteen october twenty ninth eighteen seventy six mark twain compliments postmaster james read by john greenman mark twain compliments postmaster james a letter addressed to mr s l clemens mark twain hartford connecticut notifying him that he had been elected a member of the new york press club and inviting him to be present at their fall reception on thursday last was inadvertently dropped into the letter-box without the required stamp postmaster james kindly paid the postage and forwarded the letter which in the ordinary course would have gone to the dead letter office after thanking mr james for his courtesy mr clemens enclosed a copy of the postmaster's letter to the president of the press club and expressed regret that he could not be present at the reception he closed with a compliment to mr james as follows by the enclosed printed letter of postmaster james you will perceive that the term civil service is not a sarcasm when applied to the new york post office had your unpaid letter passed through the average post office of the land i should have received my invitation about three months from now through the dead letter department after much correspondence and ruinous outlay of postage i would that there were more postmaster jameses in the land 
End of section 18, October 29, 1876. Mark Twain compliments Postmaster James, read by John Greenman. Section 19 of Mark Twain in the New York Times, Part 1, 1867 to 1879. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain in the New York Times, Part 1, Section 19, December 23, 1876. Forefathers' Day, New Englanders are at dinner. Read by John Greenman. Forefathers' Day, New Englanders at dinner. The annual festival of the New England Society, speeches by Hon. George William Curtis, Mark Twain, Rev. Edward Everett Hale, Rev. Dr. John Cotton Smith, Rev. Dr. Taylor, and others. Interesting letter from General Sherman. The New England Society's annual dinner at Delmonico's last night was one of the most brilliant celebrations of the kind that has ever been held in this city. The preparations were made with great thoroughness, and the addresses by the respondents to the several toasts were full of earnestness, good feeling, good sense, and good wit. The dining hall was filled with seven tables, the president's table overlooking six others arranged opposite to it at right angles. Above the head of the president was suspended against the wall the banner of the New England Society, flanked by silken national ensigns, and on the opposite side of the hall, before the orchestra balcony, was a national shield also draped with United States flags. The tables were elegantly and tastefully decorated with baskets and set pieces of flowers. Before the president was a design, in flowers, of delicate hues, representing Plymouth Rock, and there were many viands in the feast that recalled, to genuine New Englanders, the plain and hearty fare of the land of steady habits. The guests entered the dining-room just before seven o'clock, and at that hour Rev. Dr. John Cotton Smith, at the invitation of President Borden, said grace. Among those present were Rev. Edward Everett Hale, ex-Governor Edwin D. Morgan, Hon. George William Curtis, Rev. John Cotton Smith, Rev. Richard S. Storrs, Samuel L. Clemens, Mark Twain, Mayor Wickham, Joseph H. Choate, Rev. Dr. William M. Taylor, Hon. Elliot C. Cowden, Hon. Salem H. Wales, Commodore J. W. A. Nicholson, G. B. Loring, Hon. Isaac H. Bailey, Dexter A. Hawkins, Prof. Barthold, Sculptor of the Colossal Statue of Liberty, District Attorney Benjamin K. Phelps, Prof. F. B. Sanborn of Dartmouth College, representative of St. George's, St. Andrew's, and St. Patrick's Societies, Assistant District Attorneys Bell, Russell, and Rollins, Park Goodwin, Clark Bell, Police Commissioners, Wheeler and Erbart, and Professor W. E. Chandler, the whole company numbering more than two hundred. More than two hours were spent at dinner, when, at nine-thirty o'clock, Rev. Mr. Courtney gave thanks. President Borden then rose, and having called the company to order, he announced that General William T. Sherman had written a letter of regret, saying that in the present condition of affairs at Washington he was unable to leave that city, and William M. Everts was also detained in Washington and was unable to attend, and that letters of regret had been received from ex-Speaker James G. Blaine, Governor Tilden, Governor Chamberlain of South Carolina, Robert C. Winthrop, and General John C. Newton. Hon. George William Curtis was called upon to respond to the toast of Forefathers' Day. He was received with prolonged applause, and by many of the company rising to their feet with waving handkerchiefs and loud cheers. His remarks were frequently interrupted by hearty expressions of approval, and his allusion to Abraham Lincoln as the development of the seed sown here two centuries ago by the coming of the Mayflower was followed by vehement applause. His suggestions for the conduct of the Senate and the House of Representatives in the settlement of the political difficulties threatening the nation roused his hearers to the highest pitch of excitement, and evoked unanimous and prolonged applause. As Mr. Curtis sat down he was greeted with the heartiest cheers, 
which subsided only to be renewed with greater vigor. Cheers followed the announcement of the sentiment, the President of the United States. In reply to the City of New York, Mayor Wickham humorously arraigned a large number of city officers for alleged shortcomings, charging them with being New Englanders, and succeeding in finding so many against whom the charges were applicable, and indicated them so plainly as to cause unbounded merriment. Rev. Edward Everett Hale, in responding to the toast, New England Culture, made an address in which wit and wisdom were happily blended. Commodore Nicholson responded to the toast, The Army and the Navy. Mark Twain provoked a storm of laughter by his rambling talk about New England weather. Rev. John Cotton Smith commanded the fullest attention of the company by his response to the toast set down for him. Responses were made by Rev. Dr. William M. Taylor, Professor Sanborn, and others. THE PROCEEDINGS The proceedings were begun by the President, Mr. William Borden, who said, "'Gentlemen, will you give your reverent attention for a moment while I call upon Rev. Mr. Courtney to return thanks?' Rev. Mr. Courtney, responding to the suggestion of the chairman, offered prayer as follows. Most merciful God and Father, in whom we live and move and have our being, thou who can satisfy the desire of every living thing, we render thee our thanks for the satisfaction of our bodily appetites, and pray thee that what we shall now hear may be for the satisfaction of the higher appetite of our intellects and our reason for the sake of jesus christ our savior amen speech of mr samuel l clemens the oldest inhabitant the weather who hath lost and doth forget it who hath it still and doth regret it interpose betwixt us twain merchant of venice gentlemen i reverently believe that the maker who made us all makes everything in new england uh, but the weather i don't know who makes that but i think it must be raw apprentices in the weather clerk's factory who experiment and learn how in new england for board and clothes, and then are promoted to make weather for countries that require a good article, and will take their custom elsewhere if they don't get it. Laughter. There is a sumptuous variety about the New England weather that compels the stranger's admiration and regret. The weather is always doing something there, always attending strictly to business always getting up new designs and trying them on the people to see how they will go laughter but it gets through more business in spring than in any other season in the spring i have counted one hundred and thirty six different kinds of weather inside of four and twenty hours laughter it was i that made the fame and fortune of that man that had that marvelous collection of weather on exhibition at the centennial that so astounded the foreigners he was going to travel all over the world and get specimens from all the climes i said don't you do it you come to new england on a favorable spring day I told him what we could do in the way of style, variety, and quantity. Laughter. Well, he came, and he made his collection in four days. As to variety, why, he confessed that he got hundreds of kinds of weather that he had never heard of before. And as to quantity, well, after he had picked out and discarded all that was blemished in any way, he not only had weather enough, but weather to spare, weather to hire out, weather to sell, to deposit, weather to invest, weather to give to the poor. Laughter. 
the people of new england are by nature patient and forbearing but there are some things which they will not stand every year they kill a lot of poets for writing about beautiful spring laughter these are generally casual visitors who bring their notions of spring from somewhere else and cannot of course know how the natives feel about spring and so the first thing they know the opportunity to inquire how they feel has permanently gone by laughter old probabilities has a mighty reputation for accurate prophecy and thoroughly well it deserves it you take up the papers and observe how crisply and confidently he checks off what today's weather is going to be on the pacific down south in the middle states in the wisconsin region see him sail along in joy and pride of his power till he gets to new england and then see his tail drop he doesn't know what the weather is going to be like in new england he can't any more tell than he can tell how many presidents of the united states there's going to be next year applause well he mulls over it and by and by he gets out something about like this probable nor'east to sou'west winds varying to the southern and westerd and eastern and points between high and low barometer swapping around from place to place probable areas of rain snow hail and drought succeeding or preceded by earthquakes with thunder and lightning loud laughter and applause then he jots down this postscript from his wandering mind to cover accidents but it is possible that the program may be wholly changed in the meantime loud laughter yes one of the brightest gems in the new england weather is the dazzling uncertainty of it there is only one thing certain about it you are certain there is going to be plenty of weather laughter a perfect grand review but you never can tell which end of the procession is going to move first you fix up for the drought you leave your umbrella in the house and sally out with your sprinkling pot and ten to one you get drowned applause you make up your mind that the earthquake is due you stand from under and take hold of something to steady yourself and the first thing you know you get struck by lightning laughter these are great disappointments but they can't be helped laughter the lightning there is peculiar it is so convincing when it strikes a thing it doesn't leave enough of that thing behind for you to tell whether well you'd think it was something valuable and a congressman had been there loud laughter and applause and the thunder when the thunder commences to merely tune up and scrape and saw and key up the instruments for the performance strangers say why what awful thunder you have here but when the baton is raised and the real concert begins you'll find that stranger down in the cellar with his head in the ash barrel laughter now as to the size of the weather in new england lengthways i mean it is utterly disproportioned to the size of that little country laughter half the time when it is packed as full as it can stick you will see that new england weather sticking out beyond the edges and projecting around hundreds and hundreds of miles over the neighboring states laughter she can't hold a tenth part of her weather you can see cracks all about where she has strained herself trying to do it laughter i could speak volumes about the inhuman perversity of the new england weather but i will give but a single specimen i like to hear rain on a tin roof so i covered part of my roof with tin 
with an eye to that luxury. Well, sir, do you think it ever rains on the tin? No, sir, skips it every time. Laughter. Mind, in this speech I have been trying merely to do honor to the New England weather. No language could do it justice. Laughter. But, after all, there are at least one or two things about that weather, or, if you please, effects produced by it, which we residents would not like to part with. Applause. If we hadn't our bewitching autumn foliage, we should still have to credit the weather with one feature which compensates for all its bullying vagaries, the ice storm. When a leafless tree is clothed with ice from the bottom to the top, ice that is as bright and clear as crystal, when every bough and twig is strung with ice beads, frozen dewdrops, and the whole tree sparkles cold and white like the Shah of Persia's diamond plume. Applause. Then the wind waves the branches, and the sun comes out and turns all those myriads of beads and drops to prisms that glow and burn and flash with all manner of colored fires, which change and change again with inconceivable rapidity from blue to red, from red to green, and green to gold. The tree becomes a spraying fountain, a very explosion of dazzling jewels, and it stands there, the acme, the climax, the supremest possibility in art or nature of bewildering, intoxicating, intolerable magnificence. One cannot make the words too strong. Long continued applause. Month after month I lay up my hate and grudge against the New England weather, but when the ice storm comes at last, I say, There, I forgive you now. The books are square between us. You don't owe me a cent. Go and sin no more. Your little faults and foibles count for nothing. You are the most enchanting weather in the world. The other toasts. The other toasts of the evening were the clergy of New England, responded to by Rev. John Cotton Smith, Lafayette, who gave us himself and liberty, and Bartholdi, who gives us liberty and Lafayette. No response. The agricultural and manufacturing interests of New England, Dr. George B. Loring, and Our Sister Societies, responded to by the presidents of the Irish, Scotch, and English societies. The proceedings terminated shortly after midnight. End of section 19, December 23, 1876, Forefathers' Day, New Englanders at Dinner, read by John Greenman. Section 20 of Mark Twain in the New York Times, Part 1, 1867 to 1879. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain in the New York Times, Part 1, Section 20. January 13, 1877. Unsigned book review for Tom Sawyer. Read by John Greenman. Unsigned book review for Tom Sawyer. Shades of the Venerable Mr. Day of the instructive Mrs. Barbold, of the persuasive Miss Edgeworth. Had you the power of sitting today beside the reviewer's desk, and were called upon to pass judgment on the books written and printed for the boys and girls of today, would you not have groaned and moaned over their perusal? If such superlatively good children as Harry and Lucy could have existed, or even such nondescript prigs as Sanford and Merton had abnormal being, this other question presents itself to our mind. How would these precious children have enjoyed Mark Twain's Tom Sawyer? In all books written for the amusement of children, there are two distinct phases of appreciation. What the parent thinks of the book is one thing, what the child thinks of it is another. 
it is fortunate when both parent and child agree in their conclusions such double appreciation may in most instances simply be one in regard to the fitness of the book on the part of the parent a course of reading entirely devoted to juvenile works must be to an adult a tax on time and patience it is only once in many years that such a charming book as little alice in wonderland is produced which old and young could read with thorough enjoyment if thirty years ago tom sawyer had been placed in a careful father's hands to read the probabilities would have been that he would have hesitated before giving the book to his boy not that mr clemens book is exceptional in character or differs in the least save in its cleverness from a host of similar books on like topics which are universally read by children today it is the judgment of the book givers which has undoubtedly undergone a change while youthful minds being free from warp twist or dogma have remained ever the same returning then to these purely intellectual monstrosities mostly the pen and ink offspring of authors and authoresses who never had any real flesh and blood creations of their own there can be no doubt that had sanford or merton ever for a single moment dipped inside of tom sawyer's pages astronomy and physics with all the musty old farrago of greek and latin history would have been thrown to the dogs despite tasseled caps starched collars and all the proprieties these children would have laughed uproariously over tom sawyer's cat and the painkiller and certain new ideas might have had birth in their brains perhaps had these children actually lived in our times sanford might have been a western steamboat captain or merton a filibuster tom sawyer is likely to inculcate the idea that there are certain lofty aspirations which plutarch never ascribed to his more prosaic heroes books for children in former bygone periods were mostly constructed in one monotonous key a child was supposed to be a vessel which was to be constantly filled up facts and morals had to be taken like bitter draughts or acrid pills in order that they should be absorbed like medicines it was perhaps a kindly thinker who disguised these facts and morals the real education swallowed in those doses by the children we are inclined to think was in small proportion to the quantity administered was it not good old peter parley who in this country first broke loose from conventional trammels and made american children truly happy we have certainly gone far beyond mr goodrich's manner there has come an amount of ugly realism into children's story-books the advantages of which we are very much in doubt about now it is perfectly true that many boys do not adopt drawing-room manners perhaps it is better that little paragons pocket crichtons are so rare still courage frankness truthfulness and self-reliance are to be inculcated in our lads since association is everything it is not desirable that in real life we should familiarize our children with those of their age who are lawless or daredevils granting that the natural is the true and the true is the best and that we may describe things as they are for adult readers it is proper that we should discriminate a great deal more as to the choice of subjects in books intended for children Today a majority of the heroes in such books have longings to be pirates, want to run away with vessels, and millions of our American boys read and delight in such stories. In olden times the pirate's own book, with its death's head and crossbones on the back, had no concealment about it. It is true, edition after edition was sold. There it was. You saw it palpably there was no disguise about it if a father or mother objected to their child's reading the pirate's own book a pair of tongs and a convenient fireplace ended the whole matter today the trouble is that there is a decidedly sanguinary tendency in juvenile books 
no matter how innocent quiet or tame may be the title of a child's book there is no guarantee that the volume your curly-headed little boy may be devouring may not contain a series of adventures recalling captain kidd's horrors in the short preface of tom sawyer mr clemens writes although my book is intended mainly for the entertainment of boys and girls i hope it will not be shunned by men and women on that account we have before expressed the idea that a truly clever child's book is one in which both the man and the boy can find pleasure no child's book can be perfectly acceptable otherwise is tom sawyer amusing it is incomparably so it is the story of a western boy born and bred on the banks of one of the big rivers and there is exactly that wild village life which has schooled many a man to self-reliance and energy mr clemens has a remarkable memory for those peculiarities of american boy talk which the grown man may have forgotten but which return to him not unpleasantly when once the proper key is sounded there is one scene of a quarrel with a dialogue between tom and a city boy which is perfect of its kind certain chapters in tom's life where his love for the schoolgirls is told make us believe that for an urchin who had just lost his milk teeth the affections out west have an awakening even earlier than in oriental climes in fact tom is a preternaturally precocious urchin one admirable character in the book and touched with the hand of a master is that of huckleberry finn there is a reality about this boy which is striking an honest old aunt who adores her scapegrace nephew is a homely picture worked with exceeding grace mr clemens must have had just such a lovable old aunt an ugly murder in the book over minutely described and too fully illustrated which tom and huck see of course in a graveyard leads somehow or other to the discovery of a cave in which treasures are concealed and to which tom and huck fall heirs there is no cant about mr clemens a description of a sunday school in tom sawyer is true to the letter matters are not told as they are fancied to be but as they actually are if mr clemens has been wanting in continuity in his longer sketches and that sustained inventive power necessary in dovetailing incidents tom as a story though slightly disjointed has this defect less apparent as a humorist mr clemens has a great deal of fun in him of the true american kind which crops out all over the book mr clemens has an audience both here and in england and doubtless his friends across the water will re-echo the hearty laughs which the reading of tom sawyer will cause on this side of the world we are rather inclined to treat books intended for boys and girls written by men of accredited talent and reputation in a serious manner early impressions are the lasting ones it is exactly such a clever book as tom sawyer which is sure to leave its stamp on younger minds we like then the true boyish fun of tom and huck and have a foible for the mischief these children engage in we have not the least objection that rough boys be the heroes of a story-book restless spirits of energy only require judicious training in order to bring them into proper use in the books to be placed into children's hands for purposes of recreation we have a preference for those of a milder type than tom sawyer excitements derived from reading should be administered with a certain degree of circumspection a sprinkling of salt in mental food is both natural and wholesome any cravings for the contents of the casters the cayenne and the mustard by children should not be gratified with less then of injun joe and revenge and slitting women's ears and the shadow of the gallows which throws an unnecessarily sinister tinge over the story if the book really is intended for boys and girls we should have liked tom sawyer better 
End of section 20. January 13, 1877. Unsigned book review for Tom Sawyer. Read by John Greenman. Section 21 of Mark Twain in the New York Times, Part 1, 1867 to 1879. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain in the New York Times, Part 1, Section 21, June 17, 1877. Mark Twain, How He Got His Name. Read by John Greenman. Mark Twain, How He Got His Name. The San Francisco Alta says that this is how Samuel L. Clemens obtained the name which he has made famous, the explanation being given in a letter to Mr. John A. McPherson of that city. Dear Sir, Mark Twain was the nom de plume of one Captain Isaiah Sellers, who used to write river news over it for the New Orleans Picayune. He died in 1863, and as he could no longer need that signature, I laid violent hands upon it without asking permission of the proprietor's remains. That is the history of the nom de plume I bear. Yours truly, Samuel L. Clemens, May 29th. End of section 21. June 17, 1877. Mark Twain, how he got his name. Read by John Greenman. Section 22 of Mark Twain in the New York Times, Part 1, 1867 to 1879. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain in the New York Times, Part 1, Section 22. Amusements, Fifth Avenue Theater. Read by John Greenman. Amusements, Fifth Avenue Theater. The representation of the play called Ah Sin at the Fifth Avenue Theater yesterday evening afforded frequent gratification to a very large audience. The fact that a good many spectators grew perceptibly weary as the performance approached an end, and the still more significant fact that the audience left the house without making the slightest demonstration of pleasure when the curtain fell upon the last scene, may imply that the piece as a whole is scarcely likely to secure a really strong hold upon the favor of the public but it is certain that there was much laughter and applause heard as ah sin progressed and the causes of the merriment and plaudits appeared sufficiently numerous to give some vitality to the composition of which they are the principal element it need hardly be said that messrs bret hart and mark twain's play is by no means a very dramatic or symmetrical work. Humorists, romance writers, and poets are never born and seldom become dramatists, and both authors of Ah Sin are now trying their apprentice hand in seeking fame and fortune through the medium of the stage. Ah Sin, however, is not so bad a piece as might have been anticipated. It has a plot, well-worn and transparent, though it is at once discovered to be, and hence there is a reason for almost everything said or done during the disentanglement of the narrative. Its weakness lies in a paucity of striking events, in an almost invariable disregard of the absolute necessity of providing a strong tableau at the close of each act, and in a superabundance of dialogue, mainly coarse, and often inexcusably so, because it has not the excuse of being characteristic. Its merit is to be sought, firstly, in the somewhat novel personage who bestows his name upon the drama, secondly, as mentioned above, in its rather unexpected coherence, and lastly, in the strange atmosphere into which it transports the listener. Most of the characters do not indeed differ in any essential traits from the everyday heroes and heroines of melodrama, but their language, their attire, and their surroundings breathe an air of freshness over the picture. M. Dennery might turn them into Frenchmen, Mr. Boussicault into Irishmen, and Mr. Daly into Massachusetts saints and sinners. But the charm of local color is of great weight in dealing with Messrs. Hart and Twain's joint production, 
and the character of Ah Sin has unquestionably originality and newness. The typical Chinaman, who acts, too, as a sort of deus ex machina, presents a variety of phases of Chinese humor, cleverness, and amusing rascality. His comical naivete, his propensity to beg and steal, his far-seeing policy, thanks to which a happy denouement of this particular story is brought about, are happily illustrated. Naturally enough, Ah Sin finally becomes a little monotonous. There is, however, so much idle gabble in the drama that his appearance is usually welcome. Of the serious business entrusted to the other personages, there is, as we have said, more than a sufficiency. We shall therefore not waste much space upon the story of Ah Sin. It turns upon the rascality of one Broderick, who all but murders Bill Plunkett, the champion liar of Calaveras, and then accuses York, a gentleman miner, of the crime. Just as a committee of lynchers are about to act upon a verdict of guilty, Ah Sin fastens the guilt of the deed upon Broderick by the exhibition of the murderer's coat, which Broderick thought he had long since done away with, and Plunkett being subsequently brought into court safe and sound, the piece terminates happily. If Messrs. Hart and Twain had handled all their material as deftly as in the first act, Ah Sin would have been a very praiseworthy effort. Although the longest of the four divisions of the play, the first awakens interest and closes with an ingenious surprise. The second act, concluding with an attempt to arrest Ah Sin on a charge of murder, and with the flight of the vigilantes, who are routed by Ah Sin, expectorating water upon them, as though he were dampening linen in a Chinese fashion, is tedious, and the third drags sadly. The vicissitudes of a trial before a border jury enliven the fourth act, which would round off the piece very neatly if something besides a scene of extravagant joy worthy a burlesque prefaced the fall of the curtain. Ah Sin was capitally acted, last night, and admirably placed upon the stage. Mr. Parslow's Chinaman could scarcely be excelled in truthfulness to nature and freedom from caricature. Mr. P. A. Anderson pictured with marked force and freedom from conventionality Bill Plunkett. Mr. Davidge, as the chief of the vigilantes, distinguished himself especially in the trial scene, and the remaining male roles found suitable interpreters in Messrs. Crisp, Collier, Weaver, Vary, and Vining Bowers. Among the softer sex, Mrs. Gilbert bore off the honors in a new rival of Mrs. Malaprop, Mrs. Plunkett by name. Much of the language put into Mrs. Plunkett's mouth is far from refined, but some of it is funny, though the character and her peculiarities are become well-nigh threadbare. A still more offensive type of femininity, Caroline Anastasia Plunkett, was represented by Miss Edith Bland, with becoming masculinity. Miss Dora Goldthwaite endowed Shirley Tempest with appropriate personal charms, and finally Miss Mary Wells did all that could be done with Mrs. Tempest. After the third act, Mr. Clemens stepped before the footlights and delivered an address in his familiar vein, but with less than his wanted felicity of style and more than his wanted drawl. Ah Sin is to be repeated at the Fifth Avenue Theater every evening until further notice. End of section 22, August 1st, 1877. Amusements, Fifth Avenue Theater. Read by John Greenman. Section 23 of Mark Twain in the New York Times, Part 1, 1867 to 1879. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain in the New York Times, Part 1, Section 23. September 20th, 1877. Mark Twain's Tramp of the Sea. Read by John Greenman. Mark Twain's Tramp of the Sea. The ship Jonas Smith. A strange craft and her colored captain, begging for bread on the high seas, from Bermuda to no one knows where. Hartford, Connecticut, September 19th. Mr. Clemens, Mark Twain, in a letter to the Hartford Current, 
solves the mystery of the bark jonas smith reported spoken near cape fear recently he was on a voyage from bermuda may twenty fifth eighteen seventy seven on the steamship bermuda the bark jonas smith was spoken with a signal of distress flying she was ten days out from bermuda having left there for new york with five days provisions for a crew of about fifteen colored men a boat with three men came to the steamer and got a supply of beef potatoes and sea biscuit the facts about the vessel's history and crew as told by mr clemens are as follows one of the three men who came to us in the boat was the captain and owner of the vessel we questioned him freely and all that he said was confirmed afterward by three of our passengers who knew all about the matter the poor old tub had been condemned officially in bermuda and sold at auction and queerly enough not as a whole but by piecemeal as one may say for instance one man bought the topmasts and all the sails i think another bought an anchor another such odds and ends as skylights and such things and this colored man bought what was left viz the empty hulk and the stumps of the fore and mainmasts he paid forty two pounds for his bargain then he bought three old rags and made one do duty as a spencer on the mainmast another as a jib and a third as a sort of flying jib or jib staysail whichever you please to call it these had become rags indeed when we saw them and practically appropriate to the wandering food soliciting ocean tramp which the poor old outcast had been all these months that have since dragged by one of our passengers said that the new owner of this solemn property was offered a sufficiency of ballast for his purposes for twenty-five dollars but he was not able to afford it and so went to sea in all his perilous emptiness his idea was to take the craft to new york and sell her at a profit either as a coaster or to be broken up we did not hear of any white man being on board but of course there may have been one i don't mean that portuguese but there were fifteen colored men at first if i remember rightly i asked captain angrove how he could account for that extraordinary crew when five men would have been more than enough he said it was easily explained it was a great thing for those colored islanders to go abroad and see the world that without doubt their only pay was their pleasure excursion so this four months horror is a pleasure excursion imagine that i said i should think that unless the winds were very favorable these rags would not enable the hulk to overcome ocean currents that when she struck the gulf stream she might be carried south that the provisions would soon run out again and so taking all things into consideration that the crew might be looked on as doomed perhaps but captain angrove said that their main trouble would be their danger of getting out of the track of vessels if they could manage to keep in that they could borrow food and water and extend their excursion indefinitely mr clemens gives an extract from his diary of may twenty fifth with full details of meeting the ship leaving no doubt that his tramp of the sea has now been four months out from bermuda and is now further from her destination than when she started end of section twenty three september twentieth eighteen seventy seven mark twain's tramp of the sea read by john greenman section twenty four of mark twain in the new york times part one eighteen sixty seven to eighteen seventy nine this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain in the New York Times, Part One, Section Twenty Four, October Seventh, eighteen seventy seven. Mark Twain's War Experiences. Read by John Greenman. Mark Twain's War Experiences. His graphic recital of them at the dinner to the Boston Ancient and Honorable Artillery Company. Mr. Samuel L. Clemens 
was a guest at the dinner given the Boston Ancient and Honorable Artillery Company in Hartford by the Putnam Phalanx of that city, and in responding to a toast, said, I wouldn't have missed being here for a good deal. The last time I had the privilege of breaking bread with soldiers was some years ago with the oldest military organization in England, the ancient and honorable Artillery Company of London, somewhere about its six hundredth anniversary. And now I have enjoyed this privilege with its eldest child, the oldest military organization in America, the ancient and honorable Artillery Company of Massachusetts, on this their two hundred and fortieth anniversary. Fine old stock, both of you, and if you fight as well as you feed, God protect the enemy. I did not assemble at the hotel parlors today to be received by a committee as a mere civilian guest. No, I assembled at the headquarters of the Putnam Phalanx and insisted upon my right to be escorted to this place as one of the military guests. For I, too, am a soldier. I am inured to war. I have a military history. I have been through a stirring campaign, and there is not even a mention of it in any history of the United States or of the Southern Confederacy. To such lengths can the envy and the malignity of the historian go. I will unbosom myself here, where I cannot but find sympathy. I will tell you about it, and appeal through you to justice. In the earliest summer days of the war I slipped out of Hannibal, Missouri, by night, with a friend, and joined a detachment of the rebel general Tom Harris's. I find myself in a great minority here. Army, up a gorge behind an old barn in Rawls County. Colonel Rawls, of Mexican War Celebrity, swore us in. He made us swear to uphold the flag and the Constitution of the United States, and to destroy every other military organization that we caught doing the same thing, which, being interpreted, means that we were to repel invasion. Well, you see, this mixed us. We couldn't really tell which side we were on, but we went into camp and left it to the god of battles, for that was the term then. I was made second lieutenant and chief mogul of a company of eleven men who knew nothing about war, nor anything, for we had no captain. My friend, who was nineteen years old, six feet high, three feet wide, and some distance through, and just about of the infant school, was made orderly sergeant. His name was Ben Tupper. He had a hard time. When he was mounted and on the march, he used to go to sleep, and his horse would reach around and bite him on the leg, and then he would wake up and cry and curse and want to go home. The other men pestered him a good deal, too. When they were dismounted, they said they couldn't march in double file with him because his feet took up so much room. One night, when we were around the campfire, some fellow on the outside in the cold said, Ben Tupper, put down that newspaper. It throws the whole place into twilight and casts a shadow like a blanket. Ben said, I ain't got any newspaper. Then the other fellow said, Oh, I see, twas your ear. We all slept in a corn crib on the corn, and the rats were very thick. Ben Tupper had been carefully and rightly reared, and when he was ready for bed, he would start to pray, and a rat would bite him on the heel, and then he would sit up and swear all night and keep everybody awake. He was town-bred and did not seem to have any correct idea of military discipline. If I commanded him to shut up, he would say, Who was your nigger last year? 
one evening i ordered him to ride out about three miles on picket duty to the beginning of a prairie said he what in the night and them blamed union soldiers likely to be prowling around there any time so he wouldn't go and the next morning i ordered him again said he in the rain i think i see myself he didn't go next day i ordered him on picket duty once more this time he looked hurt said he what on sunday you must be a blank fool well picketing might have been a very good thing but i saw it was impracticable so i dropped it from my military system we had a good enough time there at the barn barring the rats and the mosquitoes and the rain we levied on both parties impartially and both parties hated us impartially but one day we heard that the invader was approaching so we had to pack up and move of course and within twenty-four hours he was coming again so we moved again next day he was after us once more well we didn't like that much but we moved rather than make trouble this went on for a week or ten days more and we saw considerable scenery then ben tupper's patience was lost said he war is not what it's cracked up to be i'm going home if i can't ever get a chance to sit down a minute why do these people keep us a humpin around so blame their skins do they think this is an excursion some of the other town boys got to grumbling they complained that there was an insufficiency of umbrellas so i sent around to the farmers and borrowed what i could then they complained that the worcestershire sauce was out there was mutiny and dissatisfaction all around and of course here came the enemy pestering us again as much as two hours before breakfast too when nobody wanted to turn out of course this was a little too much the whole command felt insulted i detached one of my aides and sent him to the brigadier and asked him to assign us a district where there wasn't so much bother going on the history of our campaign was laid before him but instead of being touched by it what what did he do he sent back an indignant message and said you have had a dozen chances inside of two weeks to capture the enemy and he is still at large well we knew that stay where you are this time or i will court-martial and hang the whole lot of you well i submitted this brutal message to my battalion and asked their advice said the orderly sergeant if tom harris wants the enemy let him come and get him i ain't got any use for my share and who's tom harris anyway i'd like to know that's putting on so many frills why i knew him when he wasn't nothing but a darn telegraph operator gentlemen you can do as you choose as for me i've got enough of this sashaying around so's you can't get a chance to pray because the time's all required for cussing so off goes my war paint you hear me the whole regiment said with one voice that's the talk for me so there and then on the spot my brigade disbanded itself and tramped off home with me at the tail of it i hung up my own sword and returned to the arts of peace and there were people who said i hadn't been absent from them yet we were the first men that went into the service in missouri we were the first that went out of it anywhere this gentleman is the history of the part which my division took in the great rebellion and such is the military record of its commander-in-chief and this is the first time that the deeds of those warriors have been brought officially to the notice of mankind treasure these things in your hearts and so shall the detected and truculent historians of this land be brought to shame and confusion i ask you to fill your glasses and drink with me to the reverent memory of the orderly sergeant and those other neglected and forgotten heroes 
my footsore and travel-stained paladins, who were first in war, first in peace, and were not idle during the interval that lay between. End of section 24, October 7th, 1877, Mark Twain's War Experiences, read by John Greenman. Section 25 of Mark Twain in the New York Times, Part 1, 1867 to 1879. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain in the New York Times, Part 1, Section 25, December 20, 1877. Twain at the Whittier Dinner, read by John Greenman. Twain at the Whittier Dinner his first and only attempt to travel on his nom de plume, the extraordinary guests an old miner had. The Boston Advertiser gives the following report of the remarks of Mr. Samuel L. Clemens at the banquet given in honor of Mr. John G. Whittier in that city on Monday evening. Mr. Chairman, this is an occasion peculiarly meet for the digging up of pleasant reminiscences concerning literary folk. Therefore, I will drop lightly into history myself. Standing here on the shore of the Atlantic, and contemplating certain of its biggest literary billows, I am reminded of a thing which happened to me fifteen years ago, when I had just succeeded in stirring up a little Nevadian literary ocean puddle, whose spoon flakes were beginning to blow thinly California-ward. I started an inspection tramp through the southern mines of California. I was callow and conceited, and I resolved to try the virtue of my nom de plume. I very soon had an opportunity. I knocked at a miner's lonely log cabin in the foothills of the Sierras just at nightfall. It was snowing at the time. A jaded, melancholy man of fifty, barefooted, opened to me. When he heard my nom de plume, he looked more dejected than before. He let me in, pretty reluctantly, I thought, and after the customary bacon and beans, black coffee and a hot whiskey, I took a pipe. This sorrowful man had not said three words up to this time. Now he spoke up and said, in the voice of one who is secretly suffering, You're the fourth. I'm going to move. The fourth what? said I. The fourth literary man that's been here in twenty-four hours. I'm going to move. You don't tell me, said I. Who were the others? Mr. Longfellow, Mr. Emerson, and Mr. Oliver Wendell Holmes. Dad fetched the lot. You can easily believe I was interested. I supplicated. Three hot whiskies did the rest. And finally, the melancholy miner began. Said he, They came here just at dark yesterday, and I let them in, of course. Said they were going to Yo Semite. They were a rough lot, but that's nothing. Everybody looks rough that travels afoot. Mr. Emerson was a seedy little bit of a chap, red-headed. Mr. Holmes was as fat as a balloon. He weighed as much as three hundred, and had double chins all the way down to his stomach. Mr. Longfellow was built like a prize-fighter. His head was cropped and bristly, like as if he had a wig made of hairbrushes. His nose lay straight down his face, like a finger with the end joint tilted up. They had been drinking, I could see that what a queer talk they used. Mr. Holmes inspected this cabin, then he took me by the buttonhole and says he, Through the deep K 
caves of thought i hear a voice that sings build thee more stately mansions o my soul says i i can't afford it mr holmes and moreover i don't want to blamed if i liked it pretty well either coming from a stranger that way however i started to get out my bacon and beans when mr emerson came and looked on a while and then he takes me aside by the buttonhole and says give me agates for my meat give me cantharides to eat from air and ocean bring me foods from all zones and altitudes says i mr emerson if you'll excuse me this ain't no hotel you see it sort of riled me i wasn't used to the ways of literary swells but i went on a sweatin over my work and next comes mr longfellow and buttonholes me and interrupts me and says he honor be to mudgekewis you shall hear how pow puck kewis but i broke in and says i begging your pardon mr longfellow if you'll be so kind as to hold your yacht for about five minutes and let me get this grub ready you'll do me proud well sir after they'd filled up i set out the jug mr holmes looks at it and then fires up all of a sudden and yells flash out a stream of blood-red wine for i would drink to other days by george i was getting kind of worked up i don't deny it i was getting kind of worked up i turns to mr holmes says i look a here my fat friend i'm a running this shanty and if the court knows herself you'll take whiskey straight or you'll go dry them's the very words i said to him now i didn't want to sass such famous literary people but you see they kind of forced me there ain't nothing unreasonable about me i don't mind a passel of guests a treading on my tail three or four times but when it comes to standing on it it's different and if the court knows herself you'll take whiskey straight or you'll go dry well between drinks they'd swell around the cabin and strike attitudes and spout says mr longfellow this is the forest primeval says mr emerson here once the embattled farmers stood and fired the shot heard round the world says i oh blackguard the premises as much as you want to it don't cost you a cent well they went on drinking and pretty soon they got out a greasy old deck and went to playing cutthroat euchre at ten cents a corner on trust i began to notice some pretty suspicious things mr emerson dealt looked at his hand shook his head says i am the doubter and the doubt and calmly bunched the hands and went to shuffling for a new layout says he they reckon ill who leave me out they know not well the subtle ways i keep i pass and deal again hanged if he didn't go ahead and do it too oh he was a cool one well in about a minute things were running pretty tight but of a sudden i see by mr emerson's eye that he judged he had em he had already corralled two tricks and each of the others one so now he kind of lifts a little in his chair and says i tire of globes and aces too long the game is played and down he fetched a right bower mr longfellow smiles as sweet as pie and says thanks thanks to thee my worthy friend for the lesson thou hast taught and dog my cats if he didn't down with another right bower well sir up jumps holmes a war whooping as usual and says god help them if the tempest swings the pine against the palm and i wish i may go to grass if he didn't swoop down with another right bower emerson claps his hand on his bowie longfellow claps his on his revolver and i went under a bunk there was gong to be trouble but that monstrous holmes rose up wobbling his double chins and says he order gentlemen the first man that draws i'll lay down on him and smother him 
all quiet on the potomac you betcha they were pretty how come you so now and they began to blow emerson says the bulliest thing i ever wrote was barbara fritchie says longfellow i don't begin with my biglow papers says holmes my thanatopsis lays over em both they might near ended in a fight then they wished they'd some more company and mr emerson pointed at me and says is yonder squalid peasant all that this proud nursery could breed he was a wettin his bowie on his foot so i let it pass well sir next they took it into their heads that they would like some music so they made me stand up and sing when johnny comes marching home till i dropped at thirteen minutes past four this morning that's what i've been through my friend when i woke at seven they were leaving thank goodness and mr longfellow had my only boots on and his own under his arm says i hold on there evangeline what are you going to do with them he says going to make tracks with em because lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime and departing leave behind us footprints in the sands of time as i said mr twain you are the fourth in twenty-four hours and i'm a-going to move i ain't suited to a literary atmosphere i said to the miner why my dear sir these were not the gracious singers to whom we and the world pay homage these were impostors the miner investigated me with a calm eye for a while then said he ah impostors were they are you i did not pursue the subject and since then i haven't traveled on my nom de plume enough to hurt such was the reminiscence i was moved to contribute mr chairman in my enthusiasm i may have exaggerated the details a little but you will easily forgive me that fault since i believe it is the first time i have ever deflected from the perpendicular fact on an occasion like this end of section twenty five december twentieth eighteen seventy seven twain at the whittier dinner read by john greenman Section 26 of Mark Twain in the New York Times, Part 1, 1867 to 1879. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain in the New York Times, Part 1, Section 26, April 12, 1878. The Start for Germany. Read by John Greenman. The Start for Germany. Bayard Taylor off for Berlin. The Halsatia carries away the new minister accompanied by mark twain and his family and the wife and children of mr murat halstead the first name on the passenger list of the halsatia that sailed yesterday was hon bayard taylor united states envoy extraordinary and minister plenipotentiary then followed mrs bayard taylor and miss lillian taylor mrs murat halstead miss jenny halstead master robert halstead mr samuel l clemens and family mr bayard taylor envoy e and minister p was on board bright and early being an old enough traveler to go early and avoid the crowd although the rain trickled through the muddy-looking skies in a light drizzle he carried one of the crimson plush chairs from the upper salon to the after-deck where thickly surrounded by his colored servant gorge he kept a watchful eye upon eight lead-colored trunks that lay upon the wharf these trunks were not pieces of high art but they fully made up in bulk and number for anything else they may have lacked it was painfully evident that the new minister had made a raid upon his friend's trunks some of them were marked l t and others h b w while all bore the words in large black letters bayard taylor u s legation berlin two were also marked wanted on the volga gorge kept up a constant line of communication between his master and the trunks 
perhaps to assure him that they were still safe or perhaps again to show that the opera glass he carried swung from each shoulder was not too much for his strength several cords of steamer chairs bearing the same ministerial marks were piled upon the trunks the new minister was smoking another of those large cigars one eye upon the trunks with the other watching the wreaths of smoke that puffed to leeward when a peculiar-looking caravan drove down the pier it might once have been a coach but it had been transformed into a sort of pyramid on wheels as it stopped and a door opened in its side a gentleman and two ladies alighted drawing after them a nurse and a large number of children whom they carefully counted the lifting of a few dozen trunks from the top of the pyramid disclosed the gilsey house coach shining with gilt it had brought to the steamer mr and mrs samuel l clemens a lady friend of mrs clemens several children and a nurse mark twain the innocent who was soon to be abroad again wore a small black silk cap which as one of the bystanders said made him look like a brakeman having checked off his family into the saloon he came out upon the deck to shake hands with the new minister where's halstead said the innocent i don't know replied the minister i haven't seen him to-day i left him about one o'clock this morning one o'clock echoed mark twain why you ought to have been in bed by that time well, i know it replied the minister and i begged reed not to keep it up the last night but he insisted and they were all so jolly i couldn't get away i've had a hard time of it the last two weeks i've had just as hard a time said mark i've been railroading for two weeks and taking mixed drinks i suppose you stick to one thing all the time straight well i don't know said bayard taylor uh, what do you call straight drinks coffee said mark or whiskey if you drink it all the time a heavy increase in the shower here rudely broke up what promised to be an important state communication mr samuel l clemens while in one of the fits of sober interest that strike him occasionally said that he was going to germany partly for the health of his family and partly to give him an opportunity to write which he finds he cannot do well at home i am going to the most out-of-the-way place in germany i can find said he fifty miles away from any railroad where i can sleep more than half the time we have not rented our house in hartford so if we get tired soon there is nothing to prevent us from coming back at any time but if we like it we may stay for two or three years on being asked whether he had more innocence abroad in mind he replied i am going to do some writing i have been contemplating it for a long time and now i am in for it but it will not be any more innocence abroad uh, that is done up and done for you'd better travel this time as the sage of hartford suggested minister taylor i will said mark or the thyme or any other herb mark twain was accompanied to the steamer by the historical character dan with whom every reader of the innocents abroad is well acquainted dan is mr daniel sloat a wholesale stationer of william street and the manufacturer of the mark twain scrapbooks dan engaged mark's staterooms several weeks ago anonymously and as he confessed was warned by sam that he must be careful what he said to those newspaper fellows dan insisted upon saying that sam is one of the best fellows in the world and the funniest and the latter statement was so evidently true that it carried the other through without question i know him from top to bottom said dan when we were out on the quaker city expedition he was the hardest working man i ever saw why out in egypt 
where the fleas were so thick you couldn't breathe without swallowing a thousand that man used to sit up and write right half the night i used to have to get my clothes off in a second and hustle into bed before any of the fleas had a chance to get between the sheets and i was vainly trying to get to sleep i'd say to clemens sam how the deuce can you stand it to write out there among the fleas oh i'm all right sam would say they've got a railroad track eaten out around both ankles and they keep in that pretty well so i don't bother with them mr taylor went below an hour before the sailing time to avoid the rain that at one o'clock came down in torrents mark twain however having soothed the youngest baby into a quiet state went down to the pier to have a last chat with dan who by the way is the image of his picture in the innocents abroad they were at once surrounded by an army of press representatives one of whom went so far as to ask twain are you going to europe a thing that in the most matter-of-fact newspaper might safely have been taken for granted under the circumstances somebody spoke of the quantities of flowers the passengers had taken into the saloon yes said mark it's all nonsense they run it into the ground i was talking with some of my relations about it the other day and told them what i thought about it particularly at funerals they said they had intended to give me a good send-off when i died but if i didn't like flowers they wouldn't send any i told them that was all right i'd rather have ice anyhow our new minister appeared upon the deck again he walked to the stem and looked anxiously up the street there was nobody in sight but an old lady selling beaded pincushions and a peanut man it was not either of these that the new minister wished to see he kept up his anxious look while mark twain still standing upon the wharf told how all the ocean steamers feed their passengers well except one line that he named which he said still gives its passengers the same fare it did thirty years ago invariably giving them boiled rice and stewed prunes every thursday for the benefit of their health the steamer had been waiting for the mail wagon and at last the wagon drove up the ship would sail in a quarter of an hour the minister kept up his anxious look over the stern post at last a coop drawn by a lame horse came in sight the minister knew the limp of that lame horse and a look of joy overspread his face he rushed to the gangplank the lame horse pranced furiously up on three legs a gentleman alighted he sprang up the gangway he grasped the new minister by jove panted whitelaw reed i was afraid i'd be too late well don't break my umbrella said minister taylor there's time enough for a last embrace there is my noble friend there is responded the alleged editor but the morning waxeth damper let us within and get a blank the voice was lost in the stairway the last word was probably blanket when they reappeared one of the halsatia's gold-laced captains was on the gangplank driving everybody ashore who was not going to cross the ocean come young feller said he to the editor in singularly pure german you'd better be a gettin off in here sir retorted the latter do you know who i blank no said the officer still in german but you've got to skip i don't care a some german word who you are we must part said the editor suddenly to bayard taylor that's so said mr taylor adieu adieu good-bye old boy don't be soft if you are out late good-bye the whistle blew the steerage passengers began to leak about the eyes they were off good-bye new minister at berlin good-bye mark twain end of section twenty six april twelfth eighteen seventy eight the start for germany read by john greenman Section 27 of Mark Twain in the New York Times, Part 1, 1867 to 1879. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain in the New York Times, Part 1, Section 27, April 11, 1879. 
too late for roger mcpherson mark twain apologizes for not making a speech read by john greenman too late for roger mcpherson mark twain apologizes for not making a speech mark twain was recently at a dinner of the stanley club in paris and being called upon for a speech is thus reported by the continental gazette mr ryan said to me just now that i'd got to make a speech i said to mr ryan the news came too late to save roger mcpherson it is sad to know that some things always come too late and when i look around upon this brilliant assembly i feel disappointed to think what a nice speech i might have made what fine topics i might have found in paris to speak about among these historic monuments the architecture of paris the towers of notre dame the caves and other ancient things then i might have said something about the objects of which paris folks are fond literature art medicine then taking a card from his vest pocket as if to take a glance at his notes and uh, adultery uh, but the news came too late to save roger mcpherson perhaps you are not as well acquainted with mcpherson as i am well i'll explain who mcpherson was when we sailed from new york there came on board a man all haggard a mere skeleton he wasn't much of a man he wasn't and on the voyage we often heard him say to himself the news came too late to save roger mcpherson i got interested and i wanted to know about the man so i asked him who was mcpherson and he said i'm mcpherson but the news came too late to save roger mcpherson how too late i asked about three weeks too late he replied and i'll tell you how it happened a friend of mine died and they told me i must take his body on the cars to his parents in illinois i said i'd do it and they gave me a card with the address and told me to go down to the depot and put it on a box i'd find there have the box put on the baggage car and go right along with it to illinois i found the box all right i nailed the card on it and put it on the cars then i went in the depot and got a sandwich i was walking around eating my sandwich and i passed by the baggage room and there was my box with a young man walking around looking at it and he had a card in his hand i felt like going up to that young man and saying stranger that's my corpse but i didn't i walked on ate my sandwich and when i looked in again the young man was gone but there was that card nailed right on that box i went and looked on that card it was directed to colonel jenkins cleveland ohio so i looked in the car and there was my box all right just before the train started a man came into the baggage car and laid a lot of limburger cheese down on my box he didn't know what was in my box you know and i didn't know what was in his paper but i found out later it was an awful cold night and after we started the baggage master came in he was a nice fellow johnson was and he said a man would freeze to death out there i'll make it all right so he shut all the doors and all the windows built a roaring coal fire in the stove then he took turns fixing the car and poking the fire till i began to smell something and feel uncomfortable so i moved as far away from my corpse as i could and johnson says to me a friend of yours did he die lately this year i mean says i i'll fix it so i opened a window and we took turns breathing the fresh air after a while johnson said let's smoke i think that'll fix it so we lit our cigars and puffed a bit 
but we got so sick that we let him go out again it didn't do any good we tried the air again says johnson he's in no trance is he there's doubt about some people being dead but there's no doubt about him is there what did he die of we stopped at a station and when we started off again johnson came in with a bottle of disinfector and says i've got something now that'll fix it so he sprinkled it all around over the box the limburger and over everything but it wouldn't do the smell didn't mix well johnson said just think of it we've all got to die all got to come to this then we thought we'd move the box to one end of the car so we stooped over it i took one end and he took the other but we couldn't get it far johnson says we'll freeze to death if we stay out on the platform we'll die if we stay in here so we took hold of it again but johnson he couldn't stand it he fell right over i dragged him out on the platform and the cold air soon brought him to and we went in the car to get warm what are we going to do asked johnson and he looked ill we are sure to have typhoid fever and a half a dozen other fevers we're poisoned we are at last we thought it was better to go out on the platform in an hour and a half i was taken off that platform stiff nearly frozen to death they put me to bed and i had all them fevers that johnson spoke about you see the thing worked on my mind it didn't do me no good to learn three weeks later that there had been a mistake that corpse had gone to colonel jenkins cleveland and that i'd taken his box of rifles for decent burial to illinois the news came too late to save roger mcpherson about three weeks too late amid roars of applause mr twain closed by saying when i'm not prepared to speak i always apologize and that's the reason i've told you so much about roger mcpherson end of section twenty seven april eleventh eighteen seventy nine too late for roger mcpherson read by john greenman section twenty eight of mark twain in the new york times part one eighteen sixty seven to eighteen seventy nine this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain in the new york times part one section twenty eight september third eighteen seventy nine mark twain home again read by john greenman mark twain home again what he says about the new book he has written a work something like innocence abroad longing for a ride on the elevated road an audience that waited in vain for a stupendous joke mr samuel l clemens who is much better known to americans as mark twain the pilgrim who was moved to tears while leaning upon the tomb of adam and the nearest surviving kin of the jumping frog of calaveras reached this city in the steamship gallia yesterday after an absence of a year and a half in europe mr twain was accompanied by his wife twelve trunks and twenty-two freight packages and the entire party after a smooth voyage arrived in good health and spirits and were met and welcomed down at quarantine by a number of friends during his absence he has visited london paris heidelberg munich venice and a number of other cities spending most of his time on the continent and making prolonged stays in paris heidelberg and munich when mark twain went away it was generally believed that his attention was to familiarize himself with german that he might prepare one or two scientific works that are still lacking in that language he not only did not deny these reports but rather encouraged them and his taking passage in a german steamer added greater probability to them it is now certain however that such was not his object he did have some designs upon the german language but not with the intention of producing a scientific work a very celebrated professor in munich who has since died wrote him a long german letter inquiring about the point of one of the jokes in innocence abroad and mr twain desired to learn enough of the language to explain away the difficulty 
after more than a year of study he says he can read german well enough but that when it comes to talking english is good enough for him yes said he in response to questions asked by a group of reporters who surrounded him on all sides except that occupied by the saloon table so thickly that he could not fill out his custom-house declaration i have been writing a new book and have it nearly finished all but the last two or three chapters the first half of it i guess is finished but the last half has not been revised yet and when i get at it i will do a good deal of rewriting and a great deal of tearing up i may possibly tear up the first part of it too and rewrite that with all this tearing up in prospect the book seemed in such danger of being entirely destroyed that one of the reporters suggested the production of a few chapters in advance in the newspapers as samples but mr twain said that the manuscript was in the bottom of one of his trunks where it could not possibly be reached he added however that the book was descriptive of his latest trip and the places he visited entirely solemn in character like the innocents abroad and very much after the general plan of that work and that it has not yet been named it is to be published by the same company that brought out his other books and is to be ready in november they want me to stay in new york and revise it he continued but i cannot possibly do that i am going to start to-morrow morning for elmira where we will stay for some time on his outgoing voyage mr twain had for fellow-passengers mr bayard taylor the american minister to germany and mr murat halstead who started on five minutes notice and without any clothes except those he wore i did not see mr taylor after we left the ship he said but corresponded frequently with him his death was a great surprise to me oh no i did not lend mr halstead any clothes he could not get into mine and besides i hadn't any more than i wanted for myself the age of the author of innocence abroad roughing it and the gilded age has not increased apparently in the last two years his hair is no whiter than when he last sailed for europe he is very much the same man except that he went away in a silk cap and came back in a cloth cap he was particularly well pleased with the steamer i don't like some of these vessels said he some of them keep a man hungry all the time unless he has a good appetite for boiled rice i know some steamers where they have the same bill of fare they used to have when the company ran sailing packets beans on tuesday and friday stewed prunes on thursday and boiled rice on wednesday all very healthy but very bad but we are fed like princes aboard here and have made a comfortable voyage we have been in some seas that would have made the old quaker city turn somersaults but this ship kept steady through it all we could leave a mirror lying on the washstand and it would not fall off if we stood a goblet loose on the shelf at night it would be there in the morning mr twain declined positively however to say whether a cocktail left standing on the shelf at night would be there all safe in the morning the ship was hardly steady enough for that there was a little ponderous silence that no one interrupted for the returning writer was evidently revolving something in his mind i want a ride on one of the elevated railroads said he i've never been on one of them yet i used to be afraid of them but it's no use death stares us in the face everywhere and we may as well take it in its elevated form i have a friend who wanted to ride on the elevated when the first one was built but when he looked at it he thought of his wife and children and concluded to walk home on the way up town a woman who was washing a third-story window fell out and just grazed my friend's head 
she was killed and he had a very narrow escape it's no use there are women washing windows everywhere and we may as well fall as be fallen upon this new book of mine said he breaking suddenly off from the custom-house blanks is different from any book i ever wrote before i revised the manuscript as i went along and knew pretty well at the end of each week how much of the week's work i should use and how much i should throw away but this one has been written pretty much all in a lump and i hardly know how much of it i will use or how much will have to be torn up when i start at it i tear it up pretty fast but i think the first half will stand pretty much as it is i am not quite sure that there is enough yet prepared but i am still at work at it the group of reporters and five or six listening cabin passengers stood by waiting for something stupendous in the way of a joke to follow all this serious talk several times mr twain's lips moved as if about to speak but he was silent the upper end of staten island was passed and the joke was still unborn governor's island came alongside the battery drew astern the cunard pier was reached and yet the joker by profession and reputation kept his audience in suspense the landing was made but the joke still lay locked up with the manuscript in the bottom of the trunk End of section 28, September 3, 1879, Mark Twain Home Again, read by John Greenman. Section 29 of Mark Twain in the New York Times, Part 1, 1867 to 1879. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain in the New York Times, Part 1, Section 29. October 19, 1879, The Innocents in Elmira, and Patriotic Letter from Mark Twain, read by John Greenman. The Innocents in Elmira, Mark Twain conducts a large Republican meeting, General Hawley, Politics, and Beautiful Snow. Elmira, New York, October 18th. The largest political meeting of the campaign was held in this city by the Republicans last evening. The Opera House was densely packed to hear General Joseph R. Hawley of Connecticut. General Hawley was introduced by Mark Twain, Samuel L. Clemens, who said, I see I am advertised to introduce the speaker of the evening, General Hawley of Connecticut, and I see it is the report that I am to make a political speech. Now, I must say, this is an error. I wasn't constructed to make stump speeches, and on that head, politics, I have only this to say. First, see that you vote. Second, see that your neighbor votes. Lastly, see that yourself or neighbor don't scratch the ticket general hawley was president of the centennial commission he was a gallant soldier in the war he has been governor of connecticut member of congress and was president of the convention that nominated abraham lincoln general hawley that nominated grant Twain. He says it was Grant, but I know better. He is a member of my church at Hartford, and the author of Beautiful Snow. Maybe he will deny that, but I am only here to give him a character from his last place. As a pure citizen I respect him, as a personal friend of years i have the warmest regard for him as a neighbor whose vegetable garden adjoins mine why why i watch him that's nothing we all do that with any neighbor 
Mr. Hawley keeps his promises not only in private, but in public. He is an editor who believes what he writes in his own paper. As the author of Beautiful Snow, he has added a new pang to winter. He is broad-souled, generous, noble, liberal, alive to his moral and religious responsibilities. Whenever the contribution box was passed, I never knew him to take out a cent. He is a square, true, honest man in politics, and I must say he occupies a mighty lonesome position. He has never shirked a duty or backed down from any position taken in public life. He has been right every time and stood there. As governor, as congressman, as a soldier, as the head of the Centennial Commission, which increased our trade in every port and pushed American production into all the known world, he has conferred honor and credit upon the United States. He is an American of Americans. Would we had more such men! So broad, so bountiful is his character, that he never turned a tramp empty-handed from his door, but always gave him a letter of introduction to me. His public trusts have been many, and never in the slightest did he prove unfaithful. Pure, honest, incorruptible, that is Joe Hawley. Such a man in politics is like a bottle of perfumery in a glue factory. It may modify the stench, but it doesn't destroy it. And now, in speaking thus highly of the speaker of the evening, I haven't said any more of him than I would say of myself. Ladies and gentlemen, this is General Hawley. Mr. Clemens was frequently interrupted by applause and laughter. At the close of his remarks, General Hawley stepped forward and, for an hour and a half, spoke on the issues of the day. End of The Innocents in Elmira Patriotic Letter from Mark Twain The following letter from Mark Twain was read at the dinner given the Gates City Guard of Atlanta, Georgia, in Hartford, Connecticut, on Thursday. Elmira, October 14th P. D. Peltier, Esquire. Dear Sir, please receive my best thanks for the invitation to meet the Atlanta soldiers and the Putnams. I was on the point of starting when a committee requested me to remain here and introduce General Joseph R. Hawley to a political mass meeting. This was a great surprise to me, for I had supposed the man was comparatively well known. I shall remain, of course, and shall do what I can to blow the fog from around his fame. Meantime, will you kindly see that the portion of your banquet, which I should be allowed to consume if I were present, is equitably distributed among the public charities of our several states and territories? I would not that any partiality be shown on account of political creed or geographical position, but would beg that all the crates be of the same heft. I am glad to add my voice to yours in welcoming the Georgians to Hartford. Personal contact and communion of the northerners and southerners over the friendly board will do more toward obliterating sectional lines and restoring mutual respect and esteem than any other thing that can be devised. We cannot meet thus too often, for whereas we meet as northerners and southerners, we grow in breadth and stature meantime, and part as Americans. There is not any name among the world's nationalities that can oversize that one. 
sincerely hoping that our guests will receive a welcome at our town's hands which will cause them to forget the length of their journey and make them willing to come again i am truly yours s l clemens end of patriotic letter from mark twain and section twenty nine october nineteenth eighteen seventy nine read by john greenman section thirty of mark twain in the new york times part one eighteen sixty seven to eighteen seventy nine this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain in the new york times part one section thirty november fifteenth eighteen seventy nine banquet of the army of the tennessee read by john greenman banquet of the army of the tennessee another long speech by the general the toasts and the speakers chicago november fourteenth at the banquet last night given by the society of the army of the tennessee at the palmer house six hundred and one covers were laid and every chair was occupied the bill of fare was printed on a card shaped into the likeness of a tent adorned with battle scenes after dinner the president of the society announced the first toast our country her place among nations general grant responded as follows general of the army and invited guests a notice was sent to me some days ago that i was to speak but i paid no attention to it at the time having had no idea until i got here what it was i was to reply to and thinking that when the time came i could execute some flank movement and get out of it but after my arrival here i found i was to be the first one to be called upon you would have me say much about the position of our country among the nations of the earth our nation we have been in the habit of looking upon as one of the first nations of the earth for a long period of time the yankee had not only a very respectable opinion of himself but of his country as a whole and it has been our opinion that we had nothing to fear in a contest with any other power i am pleased to say that from the observations that i have been able to make in the last two and a half years we are beginning to be regarded a little by other powers as we in our vanity have regarded ourselves as to the place we have among nations i think we have all the elements that go to make up a great nationality we have the strength we have the individual self-controlling independence and we have to a greater degree than almost any other nation the power to colonize and settle up new countries and develop them we have also a very great advantage in being without neighbors to molest or make us afraid it is true we have northern frontiers and southern frontiers and we get along with a very small army keeping no standing army and what little we have is not a standing army because it has no time to stand i do not know anything that i can especially add to what i have said except in the way of advice and that is let us be true to ourselves avoid all bitterness and ill-feeling either on the part of sections or parties toward each other and we need have no fear in future of maintaining the standing we have taken among the nations so far as opposition from foreign nations goes applause the second toast the president and congress of the united states was then given general logan in response discussed the relations and respective duties of these two branches of the government from a legal and political standpoint he reviewed the list of presidents who have served with honor to themselves and to the nation with special eulogies of jackson lincoln and grant the third toast the army of the tennessee under great leaders it accomplished great victories was replied to by general s a hulbert 
general hulbert's remarks were followed by music by the lombards marching through georgia the whole company joining the chorus the fourth toast our first commander general u s grant was responded to by colonel villas the fifth toast the army of the tennessee in the absence of lieutenant general sheridan was responded to by general schofield the response to the sixth toast the navy was assigned to secretary thompson the seventh toast the officers and soldiers of the mexican war was responded to by leonard sweat the eighth toast the memory of mcpherson blair and all of our heroic dead was drunk standing and in silence a dirge being played by the band the ninth toast was the army of the cumberland and its leader the rock of chickamauga their glory can never fade and was responded to by general garfield the tenth toast the army of the potomac it fought with persistent valor and achieved victory and undying fame was responded to by general woodford the response to the eleventh toast all the other armies of the union alike with us they shared the honor of its grand achievement devolved on general pope the twelfth toast the volunteer soldiers of the union army whose valorous patriotism saved to the world a government of the people by the people and for the people was responded to by colonel ingersoll the thirteenth toast the patriotic people of the united states who fed clothed and encouraged our armies and stood by us in defeat as well as in victory was responded to by emory a stores the response to the fourteenth toast woman devolved on general fletcher the fifteenth toast the babies as they comfort us in our sorrows let us not forget them in our festivities was responded to by samuel l clemens in a humorous and highly appreciated speech his injunction as long as you are in your right mind don't you ever pray for twins twins amount to a permanent riot and there ain't any real difference between triplets and an insurrection called forth shouts of laughter in conclusion he alluded to the future farraguts historians and presidents who are now lying in their cradles and said in still one more cradle somewhere under the flag the future illustrious commander-in-chief of the american armies is so little burdened with his approaching grandeurs and responsibilities as to be giving his whole strategic mind at this moment to trying to find some way to get his big toe into his mouth an achievement which meaning no disrespect the illustrious guest of this evening turned his attention to some fifty-six years ago and if the child is but a prophecy of the man there are mighty few who will doubt that he succeeded laughter and applause general grant is spending today quietly at the house of his son colonel fred grant where he held a private reception this afternoon in the evening the chicago club tendered him a reception tomorrow afternoon general grant will have his first public reception here at the grand pacific hotel lasting from three to five o'clock the public at large will thus have an opportunity to shake him by the hand later in the evening he will sit down with a few friends to a dinner given by john b drake among those invited to meet him at the dinner are judge drummond of the united states circuit court and governor gear of iowa end of section thirty november fifteenth eighteen seventy nine banquet of the army of the tennessee read by john greenman Section 31 of Mark Twain in the New York Times, Part 1, 1867 to 1879. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain in the New York Times, Part 1, Section 31, 
november twenty sixth eighteen seventy nine how his time is wasted read by john greenman how his time is wasted shooting in the dark mark twain misapprehends a post office regulation and fails to make a hit to the editor of the hartford current sir the new postal regulation adds quite perceptibly to my daily burden of work needlessly too as i think a day or two ago i made a note of the addresses which i had put upon letters that day and then ciphered up to see how many words the additional particularities of the new ruling had cost me it was seventy-two that amounts to just a page of my manuscript exactly if it were stuff that a magazine would enjoy i could sell it and gradually get rich as time rolled on as it isn't i lose the time and the ink i don't get a cent for it the government grows no wealthier i grow poorer nobody in the world is benefited seventy-two words utterly wasted and mind you when a man is paid by the word at least by the page which is the same thing this sort of thing hurts here are one or two specimens from those addresses with the unnecessary additions in italics editor atlantic monthly care messrs houghton osgood and company winthrop square boston massachusetts nine words wasted i used to use only the first line and the word boston and until the letter carriers lose their minds the additional nine words can never become necessary messrs arnold constable and company corps nineteenth and broadway new york new york six unnecessary words gilsey house corps twenty-ninth and broadway new york new york six unnecessary words even the dead people in boston and new york could tell a letter carrier how to find these prominent houses that same day i wrote a letter to a friend at the windsor hotel new york surely that house is prominent enough ain't it but i could not precisely name the side streets neither did i know the name of the back street nor the head cook's name so that letter would have gone to the dead letter office sure if i hadn't covered it all over with an appeal to mr james to take it under his personal official protection and let it go to that man at the windsor just this once and i would not offend any more now you know yourself that there is no need of an official decree to compel a man to make a letter address full and elaborate where it is at all necessary for the writer is more anxious that his letter shall go through than the postmaster general can be and when the writer cannot supply those minute details from lack of knowledge the decree cannot help him in the least so what is the use of the decree as for those common mistakes the misdirecting of letters the leaving off the country the state etc do you think an official decree can do away with that you know yourself that heedless absent-minded people are bound to make those mistakes and that no decree can knock the disposition out of them observe this i have been ciphering and i know the following facts are correct the new law will compel eighteen thousand great mercantile houses to employ three extra correspondents at one thousand dollars a year fifty four thousand dollars smaller establishments in proportion it will compel thirty million of our people to write a daily average of ten extra words apiece three hundred million 
unnecessary words. Most of these people are slow. The average will be half a minute consumed on each ten words. Fifteen million minutes of this nation's time fooled away every day, say, 247,400 hours, which amounts to about 25,000 working days of ten hours each. This makes 82 years of 300 working days each, counting out Sundays and sickness. 82 years of this nation's time wholly thrown away every day. Value of the average man's time, say, $1,000 a year. Now do you see? $82,000 thrown away daily. In round numbers, $25 million yearly. In 10 years, $250,000. In a million years, but I have not the nerve to go on. You can see yourself what we are coming to. If this law continues in force, there will not be money enough in this country, by and by, to pay for its obituary. And you mark my words, it will need one. Now we come to the ink. No, uh, let us forbear, and fancy I already see the fleets of the world sailing in it. Isn't it odd that we should take a spasm every now and then and go spinning back into the dark ages once more after having put in a world of time and money and work toiling up into the high lights of modern progress? For many years it has been England's boast that her postal system is so admirable that you can't so cripple the direction of a letter that the post office department won't manage some way to find the person the missive is intended for. We could say that too once, but we have retired a hundred years within the last two months, and now it is our boast that only the brightest and thoughtfulest and knowingest men's letters will ever be permitted to reach their destinations, and that those of the mighty majority of the American people, the heedless, the unthinking, the illiterate, will be rudely shot by the shortest route to the dead-letter office and destruction. It seems to me that this new decree is very decidedly un-American. Mark Twain, Hartford, November 22nd. End of section 31, November 26, 1879, How His Time is Wasted. Read by John Greenman. Section 32 of Mark Twain in the New York Times, Part 1, 1867 to 1879. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain in the New York Times, Part 1, Section 32, December 14, 1879. The Postal Order Again. Read by John Greenman. The Postal Order Again. Mark Twain answers Mr. Key's private secretary the postmaster general's unnecessary appendage instructed in his duties and privileges to the editor of the hartford current a day or two ago i received a formidable envelope from washington enclosing a letter and some printed matter this envelope had certain peculiarities about it for instance in its right-hand upper corner an oval black stamp was printed bearing the words United States Postal Service. In the upper left-hand corner the following words were printed in large, bold type, in three separate lines, thus, Post Office Department, Office of the Postmaster General, Official Business. In the lower left-hand corner was printed the following words, in two separate lines, thus, 
a penalty of three hundred dollars is fixed by law for using this envelope for other than official business in this majestic envelope i found the following among other things post office department washington d c november thirtieth eighteen seventy nine s m clemens esq hartford connecticut dear sir noticing your letter to the hartford current upon the recent order of the postmaster-general i take the liberty of enclosing a few copies of a tract which the department has prepared in order to meet such hardened cases as yours after reading the tract and the enclosed clipping from the cincinnati inquirer which latter i wish you would return to me as it is the only copy i have you will see that the unnecessary labor of which you complain was really as unnecessary as the complaint the only utility of which was to add to the already surplus stock of misinformation in the world and to enable some needy compositors to increase their strings by several thousand which latter end might have been just as well attained by the use of bogus i send you by this mail a copy of the postal laws and regulations to explain the allusions in the tract and hope you will take the trouble to look into the matter thoroughly the department is a unit in regarding the order as the greatest step toward perfecting the postal service that has been taken for years and its officers are confident that when the public understand it they will sustain it yours truly thomas b kirby private secretary to the postmaster general my callow friend when you shall have outgrown the effervescences of youth and acquired a bit of worldly experience you will cease to make mistakes like that that is to say you will refrain from meddling in matters which do not concern you you will recognize the simple wisdom of confining yourself strictly to your own business there are persons who would resent this innocent piece of impertinence of yours and say harsh things to you about it but fortunately for you i am not that sort of person whatever else i may lack i have a good heart therefore in a humane and gentle spirit i will try to set you right upon certain small points not to hurt you but to do you good you seem to think you have been called to account this is a grave error it is the post office department of the united states of america which has been called to account there is a difference here which you have overlooked i will point it out you are not the post office department but only an irresponsible inexpensive and unnecessary appendage to it grave elderly men public instructors like me do not call private secretaries to account bear this in mind it will be a help to you the mistake you have made is simple you have imagined yourself a dog whereas you are the tail you have endeavored to wag the dog this was not judicious you should have hung quiescent until the dog wagged you if i stepped on this tail and we will grant for the sake of argument that i did it was not to call the tail's attention to anything but only to direct the attention of the main body of the animal to a certain matter you perceive it was simply in the nature of ringing a bell that is all 
My business was not with the bell itself, but with the owner of it. A bell is a useful thing, in a measure, but it should not keep on ringing when one is done with it. Do I make myself partially understood? Lest there be any doubt, let me illustrate further, by parable, for the parable is the simplest and surest vehicle for conveying information to the immature mind. You seem to have gathered the impression, somehow, that you are a member of the cabinet. This is an error. You are only extraneous matter connected with a member of the cabinet. Your chief is one of the guns of that battery, but you are not. You are not the gun, or the load, or even the ramrod. Neither do you supply the ammunition. You only do up the cartridge, and serve as a fire-stick to touch it off. You are not the barrel of molasses. You are only the faucet through which the molasses is discharged. You are not the boot, but the boot jack. That is to say, you do not furnish the idea, you only pull it off. You are not the lightning, but only the lightning rod. Do you perceive? The thing I am trying to convey to you is that it does not become you to assume functions which do not belong to you. You may think it strange that I am enclosing this note without saying anything upon the matter which you have broached. Overlook that. Drop it out of your mind. We do not disturb the repose of private secretaries with affairs with which they have nothing to do. The newspaper slip which you have enclosed to me will be returned to you by one of my private secretaries. I keep eleven of these things, not for use, but display. Although I cannot consent to talk public business with you, a benevolent impulse moves me to call your attention to a matter which is of quite serious importance to you as an individual. You, an unofficial private citizen, have written me an entirely personal and unofficial letter, which you have had the temerity to enclose to me in a department envelope bearing upon its surface in clear print this plain and unmistakable warning. A penalty of three hundred dollars is fixed by law for using this envelope for other than official business. The servants of the government's officers ought to be, for simple decency's sake, among the last to break its laws. You have committed a serious offense, an offense which has none of the elements of a joke about it, and only plain and simple treachery to his duty on the part of your superior can save you from the penalty involved. The kindly and almost affectionate spirit which I have shown you is sufficient evidence that I do not wish you any harm, but indeed the reverse. So, if that treachery shall intervene to shelter you, I shall not be sorry, as far as you individually are concerned, but I should be unfaithful to my citizenship if I did not at the same time feel something of a pang to see a law of the land coolly ignored and degraded by one of the very highest officers of the government. As far as I am concerned, you are safe, unless you intrude upon me again, in which case I may be tempted to bring you before the courts myself for the violation of that law. There, now, receive my blessing. Go, and do not mix into other people's affairs any more. Otherwise, you may pick up somebody who will feed disagreeable words to you instead of sugar. Mark Twain 
the private secretary retorts to the editor of the hartford evening post sir my attention has been called to a letter in the current of december ninth signed mark twain and apparently intended for me although mr twain has not as yet had the courtesy to direct one of his eleven private secretaries to send me a copy thereof so that i should never have known of this letter but for the kindness of some friends the experience of others during some ten years that i owned and edited a country daily satisfied me that a correspondent who attempted to correct an editor in his own paper had mistaken his calling and as mr twain is evidently sadly in need of correction i must ask your indulgence for the following washington d c december eleventh eighteen seventy nine mark twain esq aged and respected sir i don't know that i quite grasp the meaning of your letter in the current of the ninth inst there is such a wealth of illustration in it that one almost loses sight of the matter intended to be illustrated in his admiration of the beauty of the illustrations but as near as i can make it out you seem to be under the impression that i felt aggrieved trod upon sat down upon pulled or otherwise misused either personally or as an irresponsible inexpensive and unnecessary appendage to the post office department by your letter to which my communication referred now right there is where you make a very serious mistake there was nothing in your first letter personal to myself and its misrepresentations of the regulations of the post office department were in themselves no more worthy of notice than those of a hundred irresponsible ignorant and unknown newspaper writers whose marked effusions are daily sent to the department by their misguided readers so far as the order of the postmaster general and the regulations of the department are concerned they need no defense because any man who has sense enough to comprehend them sees at a glance that they are right and the officers of the department have no time to waste in correcting the misinformation concerning them so sedulously disseminated by many of the common run of newspaper men nothing in the world could have induced me or anybody connected with the postal service to notice your letter had it appeared as an editorial in the barkhamstead bugle of freedom from which i thought it had been extracted by the editor of the paper in which i found it until i came to the signature but when i saw the signature i said to myself now here is another good man gone wrong grievously wrong here is a man that i have been looking up to for years as my guide philosopher and friend a man whose fame covers the hemispheres as the inventor of a scrapbook the inauguration of the movement to erect a monument to adam and the only man who ever dared to speak irreverently of members of the boston mutual admiration society in the presence of a meeting of that society and this man has been writing about a matter of which he is so utterly and hopelessly ignorant that he thinks he knows all about it it won't do said i to myself to let such a man as this continue to languish in darkness and reflect the same upon his neighbors so out of pure benevolence i sent you the documents believing that when you had been furnished the evidence that you were all wrong and had been so from the beginning you would not retract for that would be fatal but that you would at least say that the department had receded from the position in which you had placed it and that it was at any rate according to your latest advices not exactly the imbecile institution which you had represented it to be i am glad to see that i was not disappointed but i am a little surprised to find you laying the responsibility of your former ignorance upon the department still i don't know that i can blame you either for that or for the to me somewhat personal preface to your recantation 
in an ordinary man it would be regarded as natural but i had somehow thought better things of you you see i supposed as a matter of course when you killed your conscience you had also made away with your sensitiveness to a professional humorist a man who makes his living by prodding other people a thin skin is even more inconvenient than a conscience and i had not the slightest idea that you would get mad at a little thing like my letter i can only say by way of palliation that if i have done anything for you to be sorry for i am glad of it in conclusion permit me to suggest that if you will kindly stir up that particular one of your eleven private secretaries whose duty it is to return that newspaper clipping i sent you you will greatly oblige yours truly thomas b kirby end of section thirty two december fourteenth eighteen seventy nine the postal order again and end of mark twain in the new york times part one eighteen sixty seven to eighteen seventy nine read by john greenman